So many people are wondering what exactly led police to arrest the nurse Lucy Letby. In this video, I will be covering in detail the closing speech given by the prosecution to the jury, which outlines in detail the case against Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson is addressing the jury. Mr Johnson is explaining how he will approach his closing speech. He says what we want to do is point out similarities of the cases and point out the evolution of Lucy Letby's murderous assaults on these children and point out how calculating and devious she has been. Mr Johnson says Letby picked Mr Mansuti, a plumber, as a defence witness to pick on incidents which aren't actually relevant to the case. He says there may have been one occasion when there was a backed up sink in neonatal room 1 but it did not correlate with any of the incidents heard. If it had, someone would have noted it. His evidence isn't going to help you decide in this case. He was called, we suggest, to bolster the tattered credibility of Lucy Letby. And you might ask yourself, why? Mr Johnson says child P's injuries, combined with the insulin poisonings, had nothing to do with the plumbing. Please do not be distracted. Letby got away with her campaign of violence for so long as it was not contemplated that a nurse could do such acts. Mr Johnson says the similarities in these cases shows who this person was. Lucy Letby had used ways of killing babies that didn't leave much of a trace. Her behaviour persuaded many of her colleagues that most of the collapses were normal. They couldn't see the wood through the trees. No one no one was contemplating the possibility of foul play. Mr Johnson says Dr Breary said, in relation to confirmation bias, that senior nursing staff didn't believe this could be true, but the year was spent with increasing suspicion with each incident. None of us wanted to believe it either. Then we stopped to take a step back to think about it. The unexpected collapses, the unusual rash on a number of occasions, the association with Lucy Letby. Each time it became more statistically improbable. Mr Johnson says Dr Breary didn't know about the liver injury or the insulin poisonings at that time. Dr Ravi Jayram had said it was an unprecedented situation. Quote, it seems utterly preposterous. Then more and more happens. It seems easy to see things which aren't there. We are taught to think about common things. Less common things, rare things. We do not generally consider unnatural causes or deliberate acts. Mr Johnson refers to the Gang of Four conspiracy theory. He says in Letby's defence statement, there is a suggestion that the collapses and deaths were a product of staff shortages, mistakes or insufficiently qualified staff. Mr Johnson says Letby said that was a medical opinion but the jury have not had any medical opinion to back that up. The only things that matter is to concentrate on the issues in this case. Concentrate on the 17 children in this case and see if there are any shortcomings. Mr Johnson says for child A, let be said there were issues with the long line and if we agree it was an air embolus that Melanie Taylor was to blame. Mr Johnson says child A did not die of dehydration and it was not Melanie Taylor who supplied the air embolus. For child B, there was nothing. For child C, there was nothing. For child D, let be said there was a delay in antibiotics but child D did not die from an infection. For child E, it was delay in response to the bleeding. Mr Johnson asks where did the bleeding come from in the first place? For child F, there was nothing. For child G, initial blame with a colleague, but let's be then went back on that. For child H, some of the drains were not securely put in and potential incompetence. Mr Johnson says let be uses the word potential a lot. For child I, nothing on event 1 or 3. For event 2, Ashley Hudson was blamed for not full monitoring after child I was taken off antibiotics within 48 hours. 
that child eye had been off antibiotics for much longer. In the fourth event, potential medical staff issues with doctors being absent may have contributed. For child J, nothing. For child K, there was nothing. For child L, there was nothing. For child M, the unit was very stretched and child M was not in a proper bed. For child N, the unit was very busy, but child N was due to go home. For child O, there was nothing. For child P, concern overnight for child P's condition, but there was no medical record of this. For child Q, there was nothing. Mr Johnson adds, do you really think the gang of four would say things to get Lucy let be convicted? He says, what did the doctors say that wasn't true? Mr Johnson says the Gang of Four didn't do a very good job of scapegoating Lucy Letby as they missed the insulin evidence, the best piece of evidence of all. He says all the clues point in one direction, don't they? She's sitting in the back of the court. He says the Four didn't even know about the wildly out-of-kilter insulin readings when they blew the whistle. Mr Johnson says Letby was an opportunist who targeted ill babies. He said she tried to use their vulnerabilities as a camouflage for her actions. He says she probably would have got away with it had she stopped after some of the earlier children in this case. But in the case of the babies poisoned with insulin, she showed her ignorance of how synthetic insulin works and the biological footprint it leaves. Mr Johnson says when she thought she was rumbled in June 2016, she did her best to create the impression the neonatal unit was dysfunctional by putting in false datic sheets. Lucy Letby, we say, put a lot of effort in trying to pull the wool over your eyes. He says Letby spent a lot of time talking about being isolated from her friends. He refers to the note, quote, I am evil, I did this. He says we'll come back to that at the end. There are more important things in this case. He says it was established Lucy Letby was not isolated and was still in contact with people she had not been allowed to contact. And even though she knew that we had her phone, she repeated that lie. We went to the spreadsheet and the lie was exposed, wasn't it? She thought that if she said something often enough, it would be accepted. We suggest that Lucy Letby was an opportunist. She used vulnerabilities as a camouflage. He says the misperception of the vulnerabilities gave her away. He says Letby thought child A and child B had an inherited blood disorder and that allowed her the cover to target them. If she had left it there, she probably would have got away with it. Her ignorance of insulin, C-peptide, and the ratio to insulin allowed her to poison child E and child L. What she didn't know about was the disconnection between the insulin and the insulin C-peptide ratio. This leaves a biological footprint, which leaves foul play. She would have got away with that if police hadn't referred the cases to Dr Evans. He says Let Be returned from a holiday in June 2016 and embarked on a killing spree with child O and child P killed, and attempting to murder child Q. He says let be put in false data sheets to cover her tracks, and first put in the theory of an air embolus on June the 30th, 2016. Mr Johnson says he will look at five cases in one go. Twins, child E and F, twins, child L and M, and child K. He says for child E and F and L and M, one twin was poisoned with insulin and the other deliberately administered air. The cases were months apart. What are the chances of that? He says let be invented other cases of problems where none existed. With child K, it was that she was a serial tube dislodger, but child K had been sedated. For the two poisoned with insulin, they were deliberately targeted. Mr Johnson refers to child E and child F's mother's evidence, given several months ago, for events from July the 30th, 2015. Mr Johnson says the mother was a very, very important witness. He says the evidence was that providing milk was a big priority for her twins, 
as it was the only thing she could do. Child E was crying like nothing she had ever heard before. It was horrendous, more of a scream than a cry. Mr Johnson says screaming was also recorded for Child I and Child N. Mr Johnson says the mother described Child E's blood around the mouth like a goatee beard. Let B had said the blood came from the NG tube and the registrar was on his way. Let B told the mother to go back to the postnatal ward and had done so by 9.11pm. This is a head-on credibility contest between the mother and Lucy Letby. You can be sure Lucy Letby is lying on this, plainly as any parent will understand. Provision of milk and food to any newborn infant is important and 2100 was child E's feeding time. The mother testified, crying like nothing I'd heard before. It was a sound which shouldn't have come from a tiny baby. It was horrendous. You may think the mother would have a very good reason to remember this. Either she saw blood, or she didn't. Why would she make it up? If she did see blood at 2100, then let these nursing notes are false. Dr Sandy Bowen says the NG tube for child E had been in place from July 29th to August 3rd, 2015. Mr Johnson says that was never disputed. He asks why the tube was the cause of the bleed, as said by Letby. Letby had panicked. It was a panicked reaction told to a mother who knew no better, and it was designated to cover her tracks. Mr Johnson refers to the quote, one mil bleed let be recorded for child N. Let be interviewed on that, had said the tube insertion can cause a bleed just a small amount. Mr Johnson says the mother of child E recorded a small amount of blood at 9pm. He says if that was the case, then child E was producing lots of blood by 10pm. He says let be falsified nursing notes for child E. He tells the jury they can be sure the mother was telling the truth as the mother rang her husband and the phone call record proves that at 9.11pm. This was a call lasting over four minutes. He says the father's evidence backs up the mother's evidence on the content of the phone call. Have the parents made that up to get at Lucy Letby? Are they in on it? Are they a sub-gang of two? Mr Johnson says, of all the things to see in your life, you would remember seeing your son in terminal decline, as the mother recalled returning later to see efforts to save child E's life. He says if the parents are telling the truth, then Letby's account is a lie. He says there is a fundamental difference between the mother's compelling account and Letby's lie in the notes. Dr David Harkness's note for 11pm, Mr Johnson says, coincides with the telephone call from the midwife at 10.52pm to the father of child E in a call which lasts over 14 minutes. Let B's family communication note records, quote, both parents present during the recess. Mr Johnson says the pieces of the jigsaw fit only one way and the parent's recollection is at odds with Letby's. Mr Johnson says the prosecution say Letby attacked child E and was interrupted first time, then attacked again. He says of the mother's account, it's powerful evidence, independent of the medical evidence, that Lucy Letby murdered child E. Mr Johnson says Dr David Harkness in evidence gave a chronological sequence of what happened. He says he accepted he had been on the neonatal unit from 9.30pm. A fluid balance chart for child E is shown to the court. Quote, 15 mil fresh blood is written in the 10pm column, accepted it was written in Letby's handwriting. Mr Johnson says it was signed by Belinda Simcock. This was done deliberately so Letby could disassociate herself on the paperwork from the incident. Mr Johnson refers to the case of Child I, where Letby altered the timing for her designated baby that was due to be transferred to Stoke. Mr Johnson says Letby needed an innocent reason for why Child E's 9pm feed was omitted, and does so by suggesting Dr David Harkness was on the unit earlier in the shift. 
Dr Harkness had suspected a gastrointestinal bleed for child E. But all the observations were good and did not point to that. None of these doctors suspected sabotage. They all looked for a natural cause. This was not, however, a level playing field. There was no natural cause. Dr Harkness had said something had been interfering with child E's oxygen flow into the bloodstream. A strange pattern over the tummy area which didn't fit with the poor perfusion. There were these strange kind of purple patches. There were patches in one area, then in another. It was unusual for a baby in child E's condition. Dr David Harkness had said he had not seen these patches, no smaller than 1-2cm, to two which didn't remain constant outside of the babies in this case, child A and child E. Dr Harkness had said, quote, It was something that was so unusual, it's hard to give a clear description. Dr Harkness was traumatised by what he had seen, in the way child E had bled, in the way he did. He said, let's be by comparison on the day child E died, texted, quote, one of those things, nothing to see here. He says, let's be was gaslighting her colleagues. Mr. Johnson says Dr. Harkness was not one of the gang of four. He says one of Dr. Harkness's colleagues, also a doctor, recalled Dr. Harkness was animated when describing the discoloration. He says if Dr. Harkness is lying, then the doctor colleague is also lying. How deep does this conspiracy go? He says Letby had described, quote, strange discoloration on child E, with red horizontal banding around the stomach. Mr Johnson says if Letby agrees there was discoloration on child E, why was Dr Harkness taken to task for describing it in cross-examination? He suggests it was an attack on Dr Harkness. A medical expert had excluded the possibility of a congenital blood disorder. Dr Evans said stress for child E had been ruled out and the graphic skin discoloration provided by Dr Harkness was clear evidence of air administered into child E's system. Mr Johnson says there is only one person who could have been responsible for administering air into child E. He says for the bleed... This was no naturally occurring bleed. Dr Sandy Bowen said child E had been incredibly stable prior to the deteriorations. The 16 mil aspirate at 9pm struck her as really odd in that context. She was at a loss to explain where this had come from. Mr Johnson says this discrepancy is also seen in child N and child G and the similarities are all down to Lucy Letby's behaviour. He adds, pointing to Letby in the dock. Dr Bowen had agreed with Dr Evans to say air had been injected. The haemorrhage seen by a baby such as child E on this scale was vanishingly rare. The purple patches, Dr Bowen said, didn't fit with any explanation other than air embolus. Dr Bowen rejected a suggestion that stress in child E caused excess stomach acid which caused the bleeding, Mr Johnson adds. Mr Johnson says child E declined within about an hour of let be coming on duty that night. What are the chances of that? Mr Johnson says the point of circumstantial evidence is pointing at the threads of evidence and the collapses always happening when let be is in the neonatal unit. He adds, there are no innocent reasons for child E's collapse and death. Nicholas Johnson tells the court the level of insulin in child L was double that found in child F several months later. That tells you a lot about intention, doesn't it? He says for child A, Letby was interviewed about this and said in the aftermath she had asked for the dextrose bag to be kept in June 2015. It was put in a sluice room and a colleague had confirmed this was done. He says that Letby knew no one subsequently examined the bag. He says Letby taunted the police by repeatedly asking the question if police had the bag which had insulin in. She thought the fact that they didn't have the bag would give her a free pass. But she was wrong. Because what she didn't know 
was insulin C-peptide. Mr Johnson says experts had given evidence from the laboratory to show results indicating insulin and insulin C-peptide levels from there were reliable, and Letby had accepted this in evidence. Mr Johnson said it was ruled out that insulin could have been applied to the nutrition bag in the pharmacy prior to its arrival on the ward. Evidence had been heard by one of the pharmacy team to this effect and it was not challenged. Mr Johnson says the murderer had to have been working both night shifts for child F and child L. Only three people were working both shifts. One was a nursery nurse and would not have been in room one. Another was Belinda Simcock and the third was Lucy Letby who hung up the bag for child F. Child L got more than one poisoned bag of insulin. These are not random poisonings. He says it's obvious who is responsible, as there is only one person who could be responsible. Mr Johnson shows to the court a tiny vial of insulin, which had been added by someone who had access to nutrition bags in the fridge, of which there were a limited number of candidates. Mr Johnson says we have heard from all of them, and there is only one candidate left. Mr Johnson says it does not need to be found how it was done, as the evidence shows it was done. Anyone, if they wanted to, could inject 0.6 ml of insulin into that bag. A tiny amount of insulin could have fatal consequences. What is the state of mind of someone who does that? Is it someone who watches someone freshly born desaturating for up to half a minute in the case of child K? Is it a sick person? This was a targeted attack. Mr Johnson says we know from evidence that insulin is never put into a TPN bag. The case of child F had been referred to medical experts as the events for child E were quote suspicious. He says the first contaminated bag was put up for child F at 12.25am. Child F vomited less than an hour later. A medical expert said this was a symptom of low blood sugar as a self-defence mechanism for the body. There was also a sudden rise in the heart rate as the body produced adrenaline to combat it. The blood sugar level of 0.8 was a life-threatening situation for child F. No other child on the unit was receiving TPN bags that day, in the case of child F. The turnover of TPN bags was very low, according to evidence by Yvonne Griffiths. The bag was only ever going to one child, wasn't it? It's so sly, isn't it? Mr Johnson says the insulin contaminated bag was going to be administered when the poisoner was not on duty to be administered by an unsuspecting colleague, a member of her family, as she put it. What does that tell you about the mindset? It shows you a cynical, cold-blooded planner, Mr Johnson says. The amount of insulin in the two bags was about the same, which showed there had been thought put into the preparation. Mr Johnson says let be told some interesting lies about child F in police interview. She claimed she hadn't been aware of any concerns about child F's blood sugar. He says let be otherwise had a very good memory. You know she is lying from the text messages she sent to a nursing colleague. Police broke the news of insulin C peptide to let be in November of 2020. The constant searching of child E and F's mother on Facebook was never properly explained. Mr Johnson says let be was cold, calculated, cruel and relentless. Mr Johnson refers to the cases of twins child L and child M. He says fluids were calculated for child L by Dr Bomick. Letby had recorded, quote, Myself and shift leader A Davies have discussed this with Registrar Bomick as it does not follow the hypoglycemia pathway. Amy Davies does not recall this conversation. Mr Johnson says Letby was setting up an issue for child L. Child L's blood sugar level had improved, so monitoring was not required. Nurse Tracy Jones said she didn't change the dextrose bag during her shift. Mr Johnson says for the day shift of April 9th, 2016, Mary Griffith was the designated nurse for child L and child M on a busy shift. Mr Johnson says if people were very busy, 
then they might not have time to monitor what Letby was up to. Mary Griffith was certainly out of the room by 9.30am, as she was in room 4 administering medication to children in there. He says that means during that time, Lucy Letby would have been alone with child L. He says that would have been when the insulin was put into child L's dextrose bag, as Professor Heinmarsh in evidence said it had to have been done by 9.30am. A blood sample taken for child L, taken at 10am, showed an increase in the amount of dextrose given, but a drop in the level of blood sugar, when the opposite should have been true. Mr Johnson says the finger point of evidence is the ratio between insulin and insulin C peptide later recorded. The podding of the blood sample was delayed due to child M's collapse. The timing of the sample taken must be taken from several accounts. Mr Johnson says it must have been taken around 3.45pm. The blood sample would have been treated as urgent. The nurse said she had been distracted by an emergency with child M, which was timed at 4pm. The blood was put into a vial and then an envelope and labelled. The request for the blood test was entered at 3.45pm on a lab specimen internal inquiry form at the Countess of Chester Pathology. The form is shown to the court. The process and analysis were interrupted by Lucy Letby's attack on child M. An infusion therapy sheet for a 10% dextrose prescription at 3.40pm is shown to the court. Mr Johnson says this explains why the lab result shows a slightly higher blood sugar reading for child L than the other readings, and that the blood sample was taken at 3.45pm. Dr John Gibbs said the low blood sugar level should have meant the level of insulin in child L was also low. He said it had never occurred to him that someone was administering insulin to child L. He said he never received a lab result for child L. They went to a junior doctor who didn't appreciate its significance at the time. Mr Johnson said scientist Dr Sarah Davies had phoned through the results to the hospital as they were so unusual. The lab at Liverpool was performing very well, and Mr Johnson says it can be discounted as a possibility that the lab results were in any way misleading. He adds, it speaks volumes that the levels of insulin were double that found for child E months earlier. The poisoner Lucy Letby had upped the dose for child L. He says, as for timings, the insulin was put in the bag after it was hung for child L. Mr Johnson says Letby was co-responsible for hanging up the bag for child L at noon on April 9th and had also co-signed for the previous bag on April 8th at noon. Professor Heinmarsh says the bag was not poisoned before midnight on April 8th, 9th as the blood sugar readings are following an upward trend for child L. Insulin must have been put in between midnight and 10am on April 9th. Mr Johnson says insulin went into the bag sometime before or at 9.36am, given insulin's half-life of 24 minutes. Mr Johnson says this is a targeted attack. This is not a random poisoning. He says whoever is responsible must have been on duty between midnight and 9.36am. He says Letby came on duty between 7.30 and 8am on April 9th. The insulin that poisoned child L was put into more than one bag. All of the staff on duty have denied responsibility for this. Mr Johnson says the first poisoning was when the bag was already hanging and the second one was administered to child L as well. He says at 9.30am on April 9th, Mary Griffith was in room 4. She was not working on the day when child L was poisoned. A third bag was being put together for child L at the time child M collapsed. Mr Johnson asks if somebody did this to frame Lucy Letby, and if she didn't do this, then somebody also targeted child L and targeted Lucy Letby to take the blame. We suggest that is not a reasonable possibility. That is why all of the other cases are so important. They are not coincidences. Mr Johnson moves to child M, who was a picture of health after his birth and was doing just fine. 
The fact that his twin was poisoned puts this case into sharp relief. What are the chances of a healthy baby boy collapsing in such an extreme way? The evidence, as you have heard from the doctors, is not very big. What are the chances of this happening at the same time his brother was poisoned? Mr Johnson says circumstantial evidence can be very, very powerful. And this is a case where it is. Child M suffered a profound collapse from which he made a miraculous recovery. How many times have you heard that before in this case? Dr Anthony Yuko had noted there were issues with aspirates and a slightly distended abdomen for child M, but nothing to indicate he was to become seriously unwell. On April the 9th at 3.30pm, he was put onto 10% dextrose, co-signed by Lucy Letby and Mary Griffith. He did not get a bag with insulin in, Mr Johnson tells the court. Mr Johnson says Mary Griffith was about to take a blood sample for child L and make up a 12.5% dextrose solution, which would take time. Mr Johnson says Letby would have administered this 10% dextrose infusion for child M. The parents of child L and child M had given evidence to say one of the doctors was pressing child M's chest 10 minutes after we had left the boys. Child M had gone from fine to life-threatening emergency CPR and the father was left praying. He says it can be discounted this was all unlucky coincidence. Mr Johnson refers to a paper towel on the resuscitation notes for child M, which found its way under its own steam to let B's home. It, quote, came home with me. Sounds like a dog following someone home, doesn't it? Her explanation was, I collect paper. How long has Lucy Letby had to come up with a reason? Here we are, seven years later, and her best reason is, I collect paper. Most collectors know what they collect. It's absolute nonsense. He adds, somebody sabotaged Child M, didn't they? The attacks were almost signature, as Child M deteriorated and six adrenaline doses were given. It is a signature of the consequences of many of these attacks. Child M was at the very edge of life and the resuscitation took 30 minutes with no response. 20 minutes is the usual watershed, according to Dr Ravi Jayram. Dr Jayram then had the difficult conversation with the parents, but Child M had a miraculous recovery. Dr Jayram wasn't sure what he had done to make Child M recover. Dr Jayram had noted skin discoloration on Child M that flitted around, appearing and disappearing. Dr Jayram had said because Child M was darker skinned, it was more obvious. He added, I have never seen this before in a child. Let's be, in interview and cross-examination, had suggested the lighting in room one was not very good, and that was a possible reason why she could not see what Dr Jayram had seen. If we refer to child I, let be could see in very poor lighting what her condition was. Dr Jayram had asked in cross-examination if he was being accused of making things up. What is Lucy Letby's case if Dr Jayram is making things up? Mr Johnson said it had been suggested Dr Jayram had, in cross-examination, added dramatic detail by mentioning the skin discoloration descriptions but not recording it contemporaneously in notes at the time, and had been accused of dramatic detail when he said a shiver had gone down his spine when he first read about the effects of air embolus. We suggest that not only is let be murdering babies, she is also prepared to trash the reputations of professional people in order to get away with it. Mr Johnson says after the collapse of child M, the night shift of April 9th, 10th happened and a countess doctor described there was a plan to remove child M's ET tube following an astonishing recovery. He was put onto BiPAP within 12 hours and there was no cause for concern for a child who had had such a devastating collapse. Dr Gibbs had queries about NEC and sepsis at the time, but those could be excluded by following evidence. 
Child M required a dose of caffeine for a slowing breathing rate at the end of the following day. Dr. Stiveros later said Child M had suffered a brain injury. Mr. Johnson says this was a result of the collapse. Mr. Johnson says a fairly typical picture in this case is of babies collapsing rapidly and unexpectedly and recovering just as quickly. Medical expert Dr. Evans said there had been no reason to do blood tests for infection and the subsequent test ruled that out in any case. Dr. Evans and Dr. Sandy Bowen had said the cause of the collapse was an air embolus. Mr. Johnson says there had been evolving means of attack by Lucy Letby. Mr. Johnson says there is only one conclusion, as said at the beginning of the trial. There was a poisoner at work in the Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal unit. He says it has not been suggested by Letby or the defence that anyone was responsible for poisoning child F and child L. Child F was poisoned with two bags and child L was poisoned with at least two bags until the 15% dextrose bag was fitted and he began to improve. Lucy Letby and Belinda Simcock were the only ones present when both child F and child L were poisoned. You can dismiss the possibility that two murderers were working in the same unit at the same time. Mr Johnson says Letby has rode back from disputing the accuracy of the insulin readings between her defence and giving evidence in court. He says it will be interesting how the defence gets her out of that particular creek. Mr Johnson moves to the case of Child K. He recalls the evidence heard by Dr Ravi Jayram that Lucy Letby was standing over Child K, the alarm was not sounding and she did nothing. Mr Johnson says Letby had displaced Child K's ET tube. The Child K case shines a bright light for what happened in Child E, when Letby was almost caught red-handed. Mr Johnson tells the court Nurse Joanne Williams said it was strange Child K desaturated two further times, and the second and third incidents saw Child K well sedated. The 6.15am desaturation, the second incident, happened between 6.07am and 23 seconds and 6.15am, Mr Johnson tells the court. An x-ray timestamped at 6.07am and 23 seconds shows Child K's x-ray with a report the ET tube was in satisfactory position. By 6.15am, Child K was desaturating. Mr Johnson says the tube had gone down her throat, then had to be removed. How on earth had that happened in a 25-week-old gestational age baby who had been on morphine? Mr Johnson says Letby had no memory of this. He says Letby had been responsible for the admission process for child K. He says the cross-examination at this time was a somewhat torturous process. He relays the cross-examination of this, in which he concluded he got told off for saying they danced the dance, in arriving at that point. He says he got there in the end, in that Letby was in room 1 to obtain the medical notes for child K to input the admission details on the computer. This was on a record between 6.04 and 6.10am. He says those notes would then have to be returned to the cot side in room 1 afterwards. He says the coincidence between Letby's presence and child K's desaturation is not an innocent one. He says the third event for Child K happened at handover, which Mr Johnson says was not the only occasion. Mr Johnson says once Child K's ET tube was moved to the correct position, she picked up immediately. Mr Johnson says after nearly being caught red-handed, like in the case of Child E, she pressed home her advantage and tried to create more of a problem for Child K, which led her to desaturate again. She did this by moving her ET tube. Mr Johnson refers to police interviews with Letby, in which she said Child K's tube had slipped earlier in the shift. Mr Johnson says Letby had, in interview, created the impression of innocent tube movement for Child K. Mr Johnson says Joanne Williams had left at 3.47am to see Child K's mother and had left Lucy Letby babysitting room 1, let be having fed a designated baby. 
It had been suggested to Dr Jram he was inventing an allegation for Lucy Letby to cover for shortcomings in child K. What did Dr Jram invent? What was it that was so offensive to their case? Dr Jram walked into room one and saw Letby by the incubator. What was Letby's case here? Mr Johnson says he can't help the jury as Letby was saying one thing and then said another. He says if the jury is confused, then they have to ask why. He says the reason is because Letby won't commit herself. He asks if that is the case, then why? Dr Jram said Charles Kay's observations dropped. This was not disputed. The alarm was not on. That again was not disputed. He said the cause was a displaced tube. This was not disputed. Is Dr Jram a wicked liar to make up allegations about one of his colleagues? Or is he telling the truth? Mr Johnson adds, what lie did Dr Jram tell? We suggest it's all smoke and mirrors, that all these doctors are bad, that they tell lies, that they stitch up Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson says evidence was heard to say a nurse would not leave a baby unattended without checking the tube was secure. Joanne Williams had checked the equipment and made sure the tube was in a secure position. A big play was made of the high air leak on the ventilator. It had been accepted the ventilator was suboptimal, but said the oxygen saturations were optimal. Mr Johnson says the leak was not having any impact on child K. A note was made of, quote, large bloodstained oral secretions by Joanne Williams, but she could not confirm she had been present to see that. A doctor had said if he had seen bloodstains during reintubation of child K, he would have noted it and made Dr Jram aware. Mr Johnson says that note of large bloodstained oral secretions had only come from Lucy Letby and was entirely typical behaviour by Lucy Letby. He says in child K's remaining days before she passed away, the ET tube did not dislodge again. Mr Johnson counts the number of seconds, each one up to 30, for a 25-week gestational age baby desaturating, which he says was the sight let be sore from child K's cot side. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Even talking about it is uncomfortable. That is why it's attempted murder. Nicholas Johnson KC is turning to the cases of child O and child P. He says the evidence of Dr. Marnarides is uncontested that child O had a significant liver injury. That injury and the lacerations in the surface of the liver are the best evidence you could ever have of someone inflicting a violent injury on a small child, he tells the court. Lucy Letby's help post-it note is shown to the court. Mr. Johnson says it began with the note to all three triplets, quote, Today is your birthday, but you aren't here, and I am so sorry for that. I'm sorry you couldn't have a chance at life. I can't do this anymore. I want someone to help me, but they can't. What's the point in asking? Hate my life. Mr Johnson says this note would have been written in June 2017 or June 2018. The note was found in Letby's handbag. Mr Johnson moves on to talk about Dr John Gibbs. Dr John Gibbs had said the deaths of child O and child P were a tipping point that something was very wrong on the neonatal unit. He had been asked in cross-examination why he hadn't reported that to the police. He said, at that stage I didn't know two children had been poisoned with insulin. Medicine is not an exact science, just occasionally a patient dies and a post-mortem examination does not give an answer. But this was happening again and again on our unit, and that cannot be coincidence or bad luck. There must be a cause. That's when one common cause was identified. Mr Johnson tells the jury they have one advantage, and that is they know two children were poisoned with insulin, and they know who hung up the bags. Mr Johnson tells the court there had been no concerns for child O or child P on the shifts prior to the deterioration. Letby had, in evidence, said concerns had been raised by Sophie Ellis and were not dealt with. Mr Johnson says Letby is trying to persuade the jury that a problem existed 
when there was none available. Dr. Mabry remembered child O, and he was, quote, very well with a mildly distended abdomen, but all observations within normal limits. Mr. Johnson says Letby's issue for child O did not exist. He says Letby pointed out that Dr. Mabry did not make a note. Mr. Johnson says there were two occasions when Letby made up notes for doctors. One was a telephone call in the case of child E, and another was the imaginary examination of child I by a doctor. Mr. Johnson says Sophie Ellis's notes record that, quote, Reg Mabry was involved in being informed and reviewed on June 23, 2016 for child O. That was the difference, Mr. Johnson explains, as Letby's notes do not attribute any doctor. Mr. Johnson says student nurse Rebecca Morgan was on her first day on the ward. She fed child O and got a trace aspirate. Shift leader Melanie Taylor said there were no concerns for child O at the start of the shift. Quote, she did not expect child O to collapse. An examination of child O's abdomen revealed no concerns and this situation was uncomplicated. It also ruled out the possibility of liver hematomas at that stage. Had there been one, child O would have had symptoms of deteriorating. Mr Johnson said it was accepted by Letby that child O's liver injury happened during her day shift and she accepted the evidence of Dr Marnarides. Mr Johnson says Letby was missing a doctor colleague. She texted him, quote, Bit rubbish that you couldn't stay on NNU. He replied at 10.36am saying he should be finished on clinic duty in an hour. He then went on to observe child Q on his arrival. He then saw child O. Let be recorded no problems at 12.30pm. Mr Johnson says it is obvious child O was deliberately overfed by Let be at this stage. There was an issue at 1.15pm. Mr Johnson says child O had been supposedly fed 13 ml of milk. By this stage he had vomited and his abdomen was distended. Let be was fulfilling two objectives, Mr Johnson says by sabotaging child O and attracting the attention of the doctor at the same time. Letby had recorded child O was tachycardic, which Mr Johnson says was an exaggeration. Samantha O'Brien had said in agreed evidence, child O had a distended abdomen but looked otherwise normal. Letby messaged, quote, blew up abdomen, think it's sepsis, to a nursing colleague at 9.15pm, and for child P the following day, quote, just blew tummy up and had apneas, downward spiral, similar to child O. Mr Johnson says the 1.15pm vomiting by child O was unusual as observed by a doctor. But Mr Johnson says this is not so much in the context of child E, child F, child G and child L. Mr Johnson says Letby made a false reading for child O at 1.20pm on the blood gas chart. Even by the standards of misrecording information, this is right up there. He says the note child O was put onto CPAP from Optiflow was a lie and it had been spotted by Dr Sandy Bowen. Mr Johnson says someone looking at the paperwork retrospectively might conclude this note could form an innocent explanation as to why child O had died. Letby had said in evidence he wasn't on full CPAP machine he may have been receiving CPAP via Neopuff. I don't know. A doctor had noted child O's abdomen was distended. Mr Johnson says this was because Letby had pumped child O full of air. Nurse Melanie Taylor had said to Letby, I don't think he looks as well as he did before, and queried if child O should be moved to nursery room 1. Letby had said no, to leave child O in room 2 with his brother. Lucy Letby was so insistent, Melanie Taylor felt put out. She felt undermined. Mr Johnson explains Facebook messages were exchanged between Letby and a doctor. Childo collapsed a few minutes after the last message Letby sent. Professor Arthurs said the gas in Child O's bowel, as shown in an x-ray from that afternoon, was more there than should be. The causes were NEC, which Mr Johnson says had been ruled out, or someone injecting air down the nasogastric tube. Mr Johnson says this is even after a vomit which would decompress the stomach. 
Mr Johnson says the liver injury for child O had been inflicted around this stage, and this was long before CPR. A small rash had been seen on child O's chest, a purpuric rash which is very, very rare in a neonatal infant, similar to a sign of meningitis. Dr Stephen Brewery, who had noted it, thought at the time it could have been a sign of sepsis. Two doctors entered the NNU at 3.53pm. They saw Child O being bagged by the nurse and Child O was very unwell. A female doctor was, quote, shocked by what she saw, as it had been completely unexpected. The doctors said there had been good air entry, but Child O's saturation levels were not improving. Child O was reintubated and cannulated. Dr Breary was called to help. Child O had been resuscitated, spontaneous circulation had been re-established. A miraculous recovery, Mr Johnson tells the court. But Child O's perfusion was not as good as before. Dr Breary said the rash was perplexing and something he had never seen before. An experienced female doctor said of the series of collapses that they were also like nothing she had ever seen before. Mr Johnson tells the jury, you know the reason for this, don't you? Mr Johnson says Child O's mother gave a description of the rash. The father said of Child O, you could see his veins, all bright blue, changing colour. You could see something oozing through his veins. During Child O's resuscitation in his final collapse, a doctor had said efforts were made to decompress Child O's abdomen. In cross-examination, it had been suggested this was the cause of the liver injury. Dr Breary and Dr Marnarides had rejected this, Mr Johnson tells the court. An x-ray was taken of Child O, and Professor Owen Arthurs had explained the bowel gas which was unusual, and showed an NG tube in situ with no presence of NEC. Child O and Child P didn't have bowel obstructions, and Professor Arthur said you are left with injection of air by the NG tube. Dr Breary said all the triplets had been born in good condition and were following a healthy path. These events were exceptionally unusual, and a type of rash was, quote, something he had never seen before or since. All natural causes were excluded, even with the benefit of all the years that intervened. Another doctor said it was, quote, incredibly unexpected. Mr Johnson says Letby took Child O to his death. He says Letby was sowing the seeds for Child P the following day. A message sent by Letby to a nursing colleague at 9.33pm on June 23rd, 2016 read, Worry as identical. A conversation between the doctor and Letby is shown to the court. The doctor said he hoped he was able to help. Letby replied, yes you did, plus plus. Nicholas Johnson says two pluses was the best he was going to get. A Datix form is shown to the court, recorded by Letby, which Mr Johnson says was inaccurate, where it states, quote, peripheral access lost. Mr Johnson says this is a lie. He says Letby is trying to invent evidence that peripheral access was lost. If it was, Mr Johnson says, then air could not be injected into the infant. He says if that note was accepted, it would support her case that this was not air embolus. Mr Johnson asks the jury to find why Letby was lying, to cover up what she had done. We are sure this was air embolus. Mr Johnson says Dr Evans was taken to task during cross-examination for changing his opinion while writing his numerous reports, having come up with a number of theories. Mr Johnson says more information came to light during the course of writing his reports between 2017 and 2019. One was Dr Breary's note about the purpuric rash disappearing. It was established there had been no mention in medical notes of the rash disappearing, and he was only informed about it by Dr Breary's witness statement in 2019. Mr Johnson says, Is the impression by the defence that Dr Evans doesn't know what he's talking about? Mr Johnson said it would be astonishing if Dr Evans hadn't changed his mind when handed new information. Dr Evans had told the court, inevitably one amends one's opinion as a result. Dr Evans was asked about chest compressions for child O. 
he had said he had known no case that chest compressions had resulted in a liver hematoma, as seen in the case of child O. A doctor had said chest compressions were carried out correctly for child O. Dr. Bowen had spotted that lying entry in the GASH chart. She had taken all the evidence into account, including that of child O's father, of the description of the veins, like, quote, prickly heat, Mr. Johnson tells the court. Mr. Johnson said it had been suggested Professor Arthurs had ruled out air embolism as a cause. Nicholas Johnson says nothing could be further from the truth. Mr. Johnson tells the court that Professor Arthurs had said that air in the grape vessels could be from a number of causes, including air injected, CPR or trauma. Mr. Johnson asks the jury why CPR was required for child O. It was because of air embolus. Professor Arthurs was deliberately not doing what the jury can do and was treating the cases independently. Professor Arthurs added radiographic evidence of air embolus is very rare. Mr. Johnson tells the court Dr. Marna Reedy's evidence is both compelling and uncontroverted. He says the conclusions were that significant force was applied. It was certainly not an injury formed by CPR. He had never seen heard of or read of this kind of injury caused by CPR. Mr Johnson says the idea that this is the only time this has happened by CPR is truly fanciful. He says there is no corresponding puncture injury from a needle. The outer surface injury was likely caused after death as there was no active circulation for child O. There was profound gastric and intestinal distension, i.e. they were blown up with air. Dr. Marnaridis concluded it was by injected air and air embolus. Mr. Johnson says this case was among the most violent carried out by Letby. He adds, of all the offences, all the appalling examples, some of the earliest were less violent, but no less devastating. He cites the case of Child E as one of the early violent examples. He says Letby had misplaced confidence following her return from Ibiza, that she could pretty much do what she wanted. He adds, frankly, by this stage, she was completely out of control. She was determined to mete out the same kind of attack to Child P the very next day. Mr Johnson turns to the case of Child P. His case caused confusion with several witnesses as to when he came off breathing support. Child P was breathing in air from 6.30am on June 23rd, 2016. His antibiotics were stopped and he was put on expressed breast milk. His observations were unremarkable. A further examination at 6pm was carried out. Dr Gibbs said following Child O's death, oh no, not another one. He said he had become increasingly concerned about the number of incidents on the neonatal unit and that Letby had been involved in all of them. Child P's abdomen was full, mildly distended. Letby had said the student nurse had fed Child P that evening. Mr Johnson says this was a lie. Child P was remarkably well, excellent for a triplet baby. Blood tests were taken as a precaution at 6.45pm, showing no evidence of infection. As a precaution, child P was put onto antibiotics. Dr Gibbs said of the abdominal distension that it was CPAP belly, but he said he had misread the chart. Child P had not had CPAP for two days and had been taken off Optiflow. That was not CPAP belly, Mr Johnson tells the court. Mr Johnson says let be overfed child P just before she left her shift so she could give the impression that this was a child who was deteriorating. Mr Johnson says what happened here mirrors what happened with child N earlier that month in June 2016. He says Letby did not leave the unit until 9pm that night on June 23rd. A message sent by Letby to a doctor colleague said she was finishing up notes for child O. Mr Johnson says emphasis had been put on a good blood gas reading for child P at 8.27pm on June 23rd by the defence. But Sophie Ellis gave evidence to say child P desaturated and had a 14ml part digestive milk aspirate at the 8pm feed. 
Mr Johnson asks, what possible other cause is there other than let's be overfeeding child P for the baby's last feed before the end of her shift? Mr Johnson says that is why let's be says the last feed was done by the student nurse. Overnight, another large part digested aspirate was obtained and child P's feeds were stopped as a precaution. The NG tube was placed on free drainage. Catherine Percival Ward said child P was a well baby, but his abdomen was distended, so she decided to aspirate the stomach. This was recorded at 4am. A further 5 mils of air and 2 mils of milk were aspirated by Sophie Ellis at 7am. Mr Johnson says the problem let be had created had been resolved by proper nursing care by the two night shift nurses. Child P had been, quote, a little angel overnight, as said in agreed evidence. Letby came on duty and Child P collapsed shortly afterwards. Mr Johnson says this was Letby at her most malevolent. The, quote, worry as identical text message was gaslighting at its very best or worst, as Letby had been laying the lines for what would happen to Child P the next day. There was nothing wrong with child P at the end of that night shift. Mr Johnson says Let Be decided to use the template from the day before. Let Be recorded in notes, quote, Abdomen full, loops visible, soft to touch. Mr Johnson says that note wasn't written until 13 hours later and was a fabricated note to give the impression of what had been happening earlier that day for child P. He says Sophie Ellis recorded for child O, Abdo looks full, slightly loopy. Mr Johnson says this is the equivalent of copying someone's work. He says this observation happened out of nowhere for child P, for a child on free drainage having been stable. He says if that was observed, Letby would have escalated it immediately in light of what had happened the previous day. Mr Johnson says instead, Letby was texting a doctor colleague at 8.04am, quote, I'll be watching them both like a hawk. I'm okay, don't want to be here really, hoping I may get the new admissions. She also mentioned, I've got the other triplet and child P. Child P has stopped feeds as large asps. Mr Johnson says there is no mention of a loopy bowel for child P. At 9.35am on June 24th, Dr Yuko did a ward round and examined child P finding a mildly distended abdomen with bloating. Letby had said looping was visible at this time, and Dr Yuko had noted this. Mr Johnson says the note was checked and it was not noted. The abdomen was recorded as soft. A consultant doctor noted nothing of concern other than a distended abdomen. Mr Johnson says there is another case of Letby falsifying notes here. A nursing note by Letby said child P had been neopuffed for a minute before being examined by Dr Yuko. Mr Johnson says it is suggested this is a deliberate misrecording, minutes before child P's collapse at around 9.40am. He says it is a way of covering what she did by pumping child P full of air. Child P crashed, stopped breathing and his heart stopped. He was dusky and mottled, according to a witness. A doctor was alerted to child P in room 2 at 9.50am. It was not an emergency, but something he should be called for. Let B was not in the room, according to student nurse Rebecca Morgan. Mr Johnson says the jury should consider why that would be the case, as Let B didn't have any designated babies outside of room 2. Dr Yuko said child P appeared very different from earlier. He added, whoever was doing the neopuff was very keen on getting the doctor in. Mr Johnson says to the jury it's clear who that would be, that Letby wanted this doctor colleague to be present. For some reason, she enjoyed these situations and he was there. Mr Johnson says the second deterioration happened at 11.30am and CPR was required. One female doctor said child P was vigorous and fighting the ventilator, something which was unusual as it would not fit the sign of a baby fighting infection. Blood tests excluded infection for child P. Mr Johnson says child P was being sabotaged. 
An X-ray at 11.57am showed a pneumothorax and air in the bowel. Just after noon, a female doctor saw several nurses including Letby and told the people there the transport team would be there soon. The doctor said, I was thinking out loud. And Mr Johnson says, Letby replied, he's not leaving here alive, is he? This is something which was not disputed by the defence and Letby had said in cross-examination was said out of concern. Mr Johnson adds, however, in police interview, Letby said she could not remember saying that. Letby had agreed in cross-examination that it was not the done thing to say such a thing. Then she said she couldn't remember saying it. Mr Johnson says it was not disputed she had said it. The question was why. She was controlling things. She was enjoying what was going on and happily predicting what was going to happen. She was playing God. The female doctor had said, don't say that, in response. The female doctor said the comment was highly unusual and shocking. Mr Johnson says Child P's 12.28pm collapse should be thought of in the context of Child K. Two doctors had taken a break when a shout for help happened at this time. When they returned, Lucy Letby was in the room. A doctor said it looked like Child P had dislodged his ET tube. Mr Johnson says if the tube was blocked, it had done so in a short period of time, having only been put in hours earlier. Mr Johnson says this collapse happened at the precise moment the two doctors had left the room. He says the jury should take that all into account. He says the jury can also take account of Letby's remark, he's not leaving here alive, is he? Made shortly before this collapse. Mr Johnson says the ET tube was not blocked. Letby had dislodged it. Child P was reintubated and further resuscitation efforts began. Dr Bowen said the pneumothorax was a contributory factor in the collapse of Child P, but not the overall cause. Dr Stephen Breary reviewed the circumstances of Child P's death. He regarded the events that day as exceptional and could not find a cause. He thought it highly unlikely that death was complications over the pneumothorax. Mr Johnson describes what happened for the final collapse for Child P after the transport team had arrived. He says despite Child P's situation, there was good air entry and the ET tube was in a good place. There was no explanation for why Child P's condition had changed according to a doctor. At 4pm, it was determined the resuscitation attempts were futile. The father said the circumstances for child P's death were similar to child O, but could not recall seeing a veiny appearance for child P as he had done with child O. The mother said the third triplet had no problems and was discharged after 11 days. Mr Johnson says that should have been the case with all three. A female consultant said Letby was animated and so excited asking about a memory box and her behaviour was inappropriate. In cross-examination, the talking enthusiastically was said that it would soften the blow for the parents who had lost two of the three triplets. We suggest that is absurd. Lucy Letby was enjoying the drama, the control, the extremity of grief that she was causing to other people. The father in the aftermath of Child P's death was sobbing and begged doctors to transfer the third triplet to be taken with the transport team. The female doctor said what had happened was not normal. Mr Johnson said something was seriously wrong, they just couldn't put their finger on it. The female doctor had said in cross-examination she was not dramatising anything. The situation was dramatic enough as it was. Mr Johnson says nothing was identified medically as the cause of Child P's death. Dr Breary said the deaths of Child O and Child P caused him great concern. The rash he had not seen before or since. At the debrief, Dr Breary asked Letby how she was feeling and suggested she needed time off. But she didn't seem upset and was due to work the next day. Mr Johnson said that caused Dr Breary real concern. Dr Marna Reedis concluded there was no natural cause for Child P's death. He concluded Child P had excessive air injected into the nasogastric tube. 
Dr. Evans said there was no natural cause and the cause was air administered. Dr. Bowen pointed out a discrepancy between Letby's Neopuff note and it not being mentioned to Dr. Yuko when he examined Child P. Mr. Johnson says this is yet another false example in the notes designed to create the impression Child P had an ongoing problem. Mr. Johnson says if the jury conclude Child O received a liver injury through some inflicted trauma, then Child P's liver injury the following day can be explained by Letby's actions. Lucy Letby predicted Child P's death when Dr. Brewery thought it was under control. How could she have known? The number of coincidences here is all too much. Child O and Child P were murdered by Lucy Letby. Mr. Johnson tells the court that Letby had said she had taken one note or handover sheet home deliberately as it contained information to write up as nursing notes when she returned to work. Mr. Johnson says the note only included caffeine, so her reason for keeping it was a lie. Mr. Johnson says one of the handover sheets contains a name of one of the baby's parents, a difficult to spell name that she could research on Facebook later. He says Letby's explanations for keeping the handover sheets don't stand up to any sensible analysis. Mr. Johnson refers to the following note. He says the words, I am evil, I did this, should be taken literally. He says the anguish, as the defence said was Letby's frame of mind, needs to be taken into context. He says Letby introduced a suggestion that she was isolated to explain the notes and her behaviour. On the final day of cross-examination, the contents of Letby's phone, diary and photographs set out her social life from July 2016 to July 2018. Let be accepted she had a very, very active social life, which included socialising with many of her former colleagues, including those she had been forbidden from having contact with. Mr Johnson tells the court she was deliberately trying to mislead you and trying to invoke pity from the jury. We say she is a liar. She lied to you, and the lie is proved by analysis of her social life. Mr Johnson recaps the seven babies' cases he has dealt with so far of the total of 17. He says if they are all taken into context, the picture is crystal clear. He says he will take the next cases in chronological order with twins Child A and Child B. Mr Johnson tells the court before the cases of Child A and Child B, Let B had completed a course on IV lines which highlighted the dangers of air embolus. Mr Johnson asks if that was a coincidence. Mr Johnson says Child A had been doing well, was on hourly observations and handling well. Child A crashed minutes after Let B came on duty. Mr Johnson says there is no doubt Letby had been involved with Child A's care. He says the evidence was that Lucy Letby was literally standing over him at the time of the collapse. He says the circumstances of the collapse are similar to that of Child L and Child M with Letby operating in plain sight. Mr Johnson says despite air going in and out, Child A's saturation levels and heart rate were falling. He says Dr. David Harkness described very unusual patches of skin discoloration which he had never seen before and only saw once again with Child E. He described patches of purple, blue, red and white that didn't fit with Child A's condition and the rash flitting around. He said he was too busy trying to save Child A's life to get a full description. He was criticised by the defence in cross-examination for not noting it down. It was suggested by the defence that he had been influenced to apply this description to Child A. Mr Johnson asks what the implication was, that he didn't see anything. It was suggested discussions had deep set in his mind. Dr Harkness said he had seen it in Child A and Child E. That made him realise how significant this discoloration was. Dr Ravi Jayram had said Child A's heart trace showed no problem with the baby's heart. Dr Jayram had described pink patches that appeared mainly on the torso that appeared and disappeared. I had never seen anything like this before. 
He had said it doesn't fit with any disease process I had seen or read about. Mr Johnson says Dr Jram was taken to task by the defence as he had not mentioned the discoloration in notes. He said he had not realised the significance of it at the time and only realised it when later examples came up in other babies. Mr Johnson says the accusation by the defence that Dr Jram had made it up is smoke and mirrors to distract jurors from the truth. He says there is other evidence, not disputed, to back Dr Jram's account. He refers to Letby's July 2018 police interview. Letby had referred to the rash for child A as a quote, rash-like, ready purple, more on the side that had his line in, which was the left. How did Lucy Letby remember that? Because it wasn't actually in her notes, just like Dr Jram and Dr Harkness. Mr Johnson says Letby referred to it as normal mottling and child A was more pale than mottling. Mr Johnson says that is a lie. Mr Johnson says if Letby accepts that as unusual, it causes real problems for her defence. He says Letby used the word blotchiness for child A in police interview. Letby had said mottling and blotchiness were interchangeable. Mr Johnson tells the court that Lucy Letby had said in cross-examination if it was agreed child A had died of an air embolus, then it would have been administered by colleague Melanie Taylor and not by her. We suggest Lucy Letby was as good as accepting child A died of an air embolus. But it doesn't end there. Mr Johnson says Letby's nursing colleague, a friend, came into the unit when child A collapsed and did CPR for child A. She noted a strange skin discoloration she had never seen before. He says the colleague described blotchiness, the same word Letby had used in her defence. The colleague was challenged on the description for child A skin discoloration, that it might have been mixed with the description for child B. She said she had not been influenced by what anyone had said. Mr Johnson says the nursing colleague was not accused of making it up. He says it is the defence's case to picture the doctors are bad. Mr Johnson tells the court that Dr Rachel Lambie had described blotchy purple marks which would appear and disappear on child A. She said she had never seen anything like it before, with flushes of what looked like bruising underneath that would appear for 10 seconds, go, then appear somewhere else. Mr Johnson says all the other colleagues had proved what Dr Harkness and Dr Jaram were saying was the truth. He asks the jury if that is the case, then what purpose is the attacks on their integrity? He says the purpose was to deflect the jury from the evidence, to make it about personalities, to destabilise Dr Jaram, who has been an important witness in many cases, including that of Child K. Lucy let me knows how devastating his evidence is, in the case of Child K. He says it is the defence's case that the nurses are overworked and the doctors are bad, that there is a medical conspiracy involving the Gang of Four and an unnamed police officer who tipped off Dr Evans about the air embolus. Mr Johnson says after Letby got home, she advised Melanie Taylor about an administrative note, then searched for the mother of Child A on Facebook. Mr Johnson turns to the case of child B. Mr Johnson says, We know that Letby didn't like being in nursery room free, and there are many text messages sent between Letby and four people over the course of two hours. Five minutes after child B desaturated around midnight on June the 9th, 10th shift, Mr Johnson says Letby turned up in room one as she co-signed for medication. No one signed for the observation readings for child B at midnight. Letby has signed for a blood gas reading for child B at 12.16am. Child B had collapsed at 12.30am. The mother of child A and child B said it was, quote, a very similar situation to child A, and the consultant asked for pictures to be taken of the motling as she had never seen it before. By the time a camera had been sourced, the motling had disappeared. Dr Lambie had made a note of the discoloration at the time. A nursing colleague said child B suddenly looked very ill, like her brother the night before, with the discoloration. Mr Johnson says the colleague had said, oh no, not again, 
and made a note of it which read, changed rapidly to purple blotchiness with white patches. Mr Johnson says Letby had used the words a rash-like appearance as it looked like a rash on child B and it was unusual. Lucy Letby, we suggest, could not keep out of nursery room one. She elbowed her mate out of the way. Letby signed for a blood gas record for child B at 12.51am while child B was being resuscitated then signed for a 1am observation reading and co-signed for a morphine administration at 1.10am. She was relentless, ladies and gentlemen. She thought she had the cover of antiphospholipid syndrome for child B. Let B search for child A and child B's mother again on Facebook on June 12th and September 2nd, 2015. Mr Johnson says the presence of air was the cause of or the need for resuscitation. Professor Arthur says the gas was not diagnostic of air embolus, but added it was the most pragmatic conclusion. He adds the only time he saw that much gas was in the case of child D. Mr Johnson says medical expert evidence from Dr Marna Reedes had shown an air bubble was found in child A's brain, which was highly suggestive of air embolus. He found no evidence of any natural disease and took the view that the most likely cause was air embolus. Mr Johnson says the picture is clear from the witnesses' accounts, including Letby's, that air embolus was the cause of child A's death and if that is the case, then Letby was responsible. Dr Evans says for child A, the baby was perfectly stable prior to the collapse. He cited air embolus as the cause and that conclusion was reached even before Dr J Ram's account as Dr J Ram's description had not been in the notes. He said for child B there was nothing that could account for that baby's collapse. He said the rapid appearance and disappearance of the skin discoloration was significant in his conclusion of air embolus. Medical expert Dr Sandy Bowen said child A had been stable and the misplaced UVC line had no bearing on his collapse. She said child A had received an air embolus. In cross-examination it was suggested she could not exclude genetic causes for the death of child A. She replied she did not know of any genetic condition that causes a baby to collapse and die within 24 hours of birth. Mr Johnson says Letby's case floats the spectre of possibilities without going into specifics. Mr Johnson said dehydration was also ruled out as a possible cause of death for child A. Asked about an innocent air embolus via the catheter, Dr Bowen said she had never heard of it happening in a neonatal unit due to the equipment used. For child B, Dr Bowen had said the baby was in good shape. She concluded child B had received an air embolus. Mr Johnson says the jury has an advantage over medical experts in that they can look at all the pieces of evidence presented in this case, including Letby's Facebook searches for the parents, her presence on the unit, standing by babies, and there being a poisoner at work on the unit to draw conclusions. It's the cumulative evidence, Mr Johnson says, which is key. Mr Johnson now turns to the case of child C. He says Dr John Gibbs first gave evidence on Halloween 2022. He was asked if child C should have been treated at a tertiary centre. Dr Gibbs replied it depended on what caused child C's collapse. He denied that in any event it would have been more suitable for child C to be treated there. Mr Johnson says there has been no evidence presented to suggest the babies in this case would have been better treated at a tertiary centre, the Countess of Chester Hospital being a level 2 unit at the time. Mr Johnson says the jury should ask if there had been any specific shortcomings for the babies in each case. He says the babies would have been better off away from Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson says child C, a baby boy, was born in good condition, made good progress and was handling well. A nursing family communication note on June 12th at 6.30pm is read to the court. Parents spent most of the day with child C, enjoyed kangaroo care most of the afternoon. Mr Johnson says this was a good sign. 
Dr Catherine Davies was asked about traces of bile which were found. She was asked in evidence if that was a sign the baby would later collapse. She replied, absolutely not. Mr Johnson tells the court she said the child C's abdomen was soft and if he had an abdominal problem it would be sore, but he was handling well and his other observations were stable, which was why he had been out for kangaroo care. By June 13th, 2015, Child C was given tiny milk feeds to get things moving in the gut. Mr Johnson tells the court, witness after witness gave evidence to say the bile aspirates were very small and the black colour was altered blood, not bile. Dr Gibbs said the blood had come from inflammation in the stomach and Child C was given a drug to treat that. Mr Johnson says the jury know as a fact from Dr Marna Reedis that Child C did not have a problem with his gut as there was no sign of infection or sepsis. There was no evidence of Child C having had an obstruction in his bowel. This is not a case of NEC. Nurse Yvonne Griffiths described Child C as an active baby who was happiest when receiving kangaroo care. Nurse Sophie Ellis said Child C was quote feisty. Mr Johnson says all the treating staff for Child C said he was doing very well on the three days that Letby was not on the unit. He says within a few hours of Letby coming onto the unit, Child C collapsed and within a few hours of that collapse, died. Mr Johnson said Dr Gibbs could not explain how Child C's heart could have restarted after the collapse as it did not follow any natural disease process. Dr Sally Ogden said Child C's abdomen was, on June the 13th, soft. Mr Johnson says he was doing well, as observations were normal, and he was put onto Optiflow having come off CPAP breathing support. Letby's nursing colleague suggested to Letby that the baby in room 3 was more of a priority, as that baby had breathing difficulties than Child C in room 1. Lucy Letby was not happy about being in nursery room 3, Mr Johnson tells the court. Letby texted colleague Jennifer Jones Key, quote, I keep thinking about Monday, feel like I need to be in room 1 to overcome it, but colleague said no. Not the vented baby necessarily, I just feel I need to be in room 1 to get the image out of my head. Mel said the same and colleague let her go. Being in 3 is eating me up. All I can see is him in room one. Mr Johnson says the baby who was not vented would be child C. Mr Johnson says there was no reason for Letby to be in room one. Letby texted Jennifer Jones Key again, quote, Yeah, I've done a couple of meds in room one. I'll be fine. Mr Johnson says this is something Letby has since revised in her evidence. The neonatal schedule shows Letby being a co-signer for babies in room three. Mr Johnson says it was repeatedly questioned whether Sophie Ellis, the new girl, was up to the mark to look after child C. Three separate nurses dismissed that suggestion. Mr Johnson says in cross-examination this was taken up with Letby. The person who had what you wanted wasn't sufficiently qualified for the job? Letby replied, no, Sophie wasn't. I think in the correct position to care for child C. And why was that? She was recently qualified. She didn't have the skills. She didn't have the experience of premature babies, like baby C. I'm not saying Sophie caused anything with child C. She was just the least experienced. She had very little experience with premature babies. So she had something you wanted? Letby replied, no. Mr Johnson asks the jury what Sophie Ellis failed to do that a senior nurse would have done. He says there is no evidence of anything and asks why that suggestion was made to three nurses in cross-examination. He says it is trying to create something seriously wrong at the hospital, and is gaslighting the jury. Mr Johnson says the series of text messages and its content in relation to suggests Letby was not rushed off her feet, but instead had death on her mind and sabotaged Child C. Sophie Ellis had aspirated Child C's stomach and found a small amount of green bile. There was no air or anything else. She left the room and within a short amount of time, the alarm went off. Upon her return, Letby was standing by Child C and Letby said words to the effect of, he's just had a braddy. 
Nurse Melanie Taylor was challenged repeatedly on her account of the event. She said she remembered Letby being at the centre of the event. She said she was surprised at how cool and calm Letby was. Dr Catherine Davies was crash bleeped to the room. There were no heart sounds or respiration and this was very unusual. She said even with the smallest, sickest babies who had collapsed, there would be some heartbeat or respiration rate. But with child C, there was nothing at all. During intubation, child C's vocal cords were seen by Dr Davies to be swollen. Mr Johnson says that is found in five of the baby's cases in child E, child G, child H and child N. Somebody put something down child C's throat. Who do you believe that was? Dr Gibbs said if there had been an abdominal obstruction, there would have been repeated vomiting. Child C's parents had given evidence in an agreed statement when Child C had started breathing after being baptised. We held him for hours and he was given another dose of morphine. The rally of survival lasted a long time, Mr Johnson tells the court. He says during the time with the family, they were interrupted by a nurse the father believed to be Lucy Letby. The father recalled the nurse said words to the effect of, you've said your goodbyes, do you want to put him in here? A nursing colleague had told Letby more than once to look after her designated baby as she had been going in and out of the family room. Mr Johnson asks why Letby had a fascination with that room and cites her behaviour as noted in the cases of child I and child P. It is not an innocent coincidence. He says Letby in cross-examination could not give a plausible reason why she kept going into that family room instead of looking after her designated baby that night. Text messages between Letby and a colleague were exchanged on June 30th, 2015. The colleague wrote, Yeah, there's something odd about that night, and the other three that went so suddenly. Letby replied, What do you mean? Or that we lost three and in different circumstances? Colleague replies, I don't know. Were they that different? Ignore me, I'm speculating. Letby replied, Well, baby C was tiny, obviously compromised in utero. Baby D, septic. It's baby A I can't get my head around. The colleague replies, Was she definitely septic? Did the post-mortem confirm? Letby replied, I don't think the full PM is back yet. Debrief is next week, but I'm away. The colleague replies, When's baby A's? They were talking of doing a joint one for all three, as all close together and similar in being full of rests in babies that are essentially stable. Don't know if they're doing that now, though. Letby replies, Ah, oh, not sure, but baby C's is on Thursday and baby D next week. No mention of baby A. Mr Johnson says Dr Evans was justifiably criticised for not giving a cause of death for child C in written evidence, then giving a cause in the witness box. He returned to give evidence on 14 more occasions. Mr Johnson says Dr Evans' evidence can be disregarded if there has been confusion for this case, as Dr Marnarides had given more detailed evidence on this. Dr Bowen excluded the possibility of bowel obstruction. Dr Marnarides said there was nothing unusual about child C's bowel. He concluded child C died with pneumonia, not from pneumonia, and the gas in the bowel could not be explained by infection or an abnormality in the bowel. He said that air must have been injected into the nasogastric tube, splinting the diaphragm, which would have compromised child C's breathing and killed him. He added, I have never in the past 10 years come across even a suggestion that CPAP belly would lead to the deterioration of a baby, let alone this gastric distension that would lead to a baby's death. Mr Johnson says child C came off CPAP 12 hours before his collapse. He did so well after kangaroo care, he was put onto Optiflow, a much less invasive method of breathing support. His NG tube had also been aspirated shortly before his collapse and no air was found. Dr Marnarides described massive gastric distension, using the word ballooning. Mr Johnson says Letby's interviews are very important in this case. Letby had said her only involvement with child C was with his resuscitation. She said she did not remember being the nurse who fed him. She claimed she was not the person who discovered child C collapsing. 
She said rough notes on the resuscitation would be transposed into medical notes and then disposed of. She confirmed she had contact with Child C's family when Child C was dying. She would not accept Sophie Ellis's account of her standing over Child C. When asked why she would have been in room 1, Letby said perhaps she was checking the resus trolley or getting drugs for her baby or using the computer. Mr Johnson says, why would you be checking the resus trolley and why would you use a computer in the dark? Letby was asked about the text message conversation with Jennifer Jones Key. She claimed unbelievably she didn't know what that conversation was about or where she was when that text conversation took place. We say that is incredible. That is not believable. Of the message being in free is eating me up, let be accepted she was frustrated she was not in nursery one. She let be accepted she was in room one at the time of the collapse, that she was the only member of staff there and she was feeling frustrated and upset. In the 2020 police interview, Letby said she did not remember being involved with Child C's family after Child C's collapse. She said she wasn't sure why she had searched for Child C's family on Facebook. She said she didn't specifically remember what she was thinking prior to the collapse of Child C. Mr Johnson says the collapse and death is inconsistent with all natural causes according to the medical evidence. Letby was in her own interview angry and frustrated about not being in room one. She started the interview process by lying about where she was and the reasons for being in room one. Child C had massive ballooning of the stomach and it's obvious what happened, even without the context of the other cases. It's as plain as the nose on your face that Lucy Letby must have injected air down the nasogastric tube into Child C. It was one of her favourite ways of trying to kill children in this case. Mr Johnson says there is a constellation of coincidences that can make the jury sure Child C did not die of natural causes and that Lucy Letby killed him. Mr Johnson turns to the case of Child D. He says Letby didn't really remember the baby girl as she had said that in police interview. He says the absence from the paperwork of her involvement would give her plausible deniability. He says, however, thanks to the hard work of the police, they can put her in the room. He says Letby's interview is undermined by the rotor diagram, putting her in room one on the night shift with Child D and for her searching for the parents' names on Facebook. He says Letby could have got the names from the handover sheets, but the handover sheets do not have the parents' names on them. Mr Johnson says this is similar to Child K when Letby searched for the parents on Facebook 26 months after Child K's time on the neonatal unit. Letby could offer no explanation for this, which Mr Johnson says is a lie. Why won't she tell you the truth? Mr Johnson says there is no doubt that Child D and her mother suffered suboptimal care at the hospital, but her progress went upward upon her transfer to the neonatal unit. Child D was stable with minimal oxygen support and responding well to treatment. The court had previously heard evidence Child D was on CPAP, responsive when handled, and her chest was clear with regular respiratory effort. Her abdomen was soft and non-distended. Mr Johnson turns to the night shift on June 21st, 22nd, 2015. Mr Johnson says June 21st was Father's Day that year. Child D's designated nurse, Caroline Oakley, also had a designated baby in room two. Child D was in room one. Let B's designated baby in room three from the Child C case was now in room one, again as Let B's designated baby along with another baby also in room one. Child D's observations were all completely normal according to Caroline Oakley and she was breathing beautifully in air with 100% oxygen saturation, the highest they can be. Mr Johnson says this couldn't be better for a child with pneumonia. Dr Andrew Brunton said the plan for Child D was to start receiving milk. Mr Johnson says there were no problems until Caroline Oakley left the room for a break. 
He cites other cases when this happened, of staff members who left and babies collapsed. The alarm went off and when Catherine Percival Ward arrived, she found Letby in room one. She said in cross-examination she couldn't be certain. Mr Johnson says, who else could it have been? Who else had children to care for in that room? He says it wasn't any of the other nurses on duty that night. One was looking after babies in room two, and another was Elizabeth Marshall, a nursery nurse, who said she saw Letby doing chest compressions on child C in room one. Catherine Percival Ward said the rash on child D was something she had never seen before. In cross-examination, she was accused of adding detail to the skin discoloration description. Mr Johnson says it was in the original recording she had made to police. A, quote, mosaic, a mottling colour of blotchiness. Caroline Oakley recalled being called back to room one by Catherine Percival Ward and Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson had asked Letby in cross-examination why she was writing in Child D's chart. Letby said she could not comment if she had been in room one throughout. The timing on the neonatal schedule shown to the court says the note was made at the time of Child D's collapse. Mr Johnson says an observation reading for Child D is timed at 1.15am on June 22nd, written by Caroline Oakley. Those details were told to her by the girls. Mr Johnson asked who of the girls would have provided those readings. Mr Johnson says Letby did not want the paperwork to attach her to the case of Child D and that was why she minimised her involvement in police interview. A blood gas chart for Child D at 1.14am is not signed. Letby in cross-examination said, I don't know, when asked if it was in her writing. Letby accepted that elevated 14 on 0114 is in her style of writing. Letby said the lack of a signature was an error and said the following entry was also unsigned and happens from time to time. Mr Johnson says it's the timing of this absent signature which is the power of circumstantial evidence. Mr Johnson says Letby gave an IV infusion to child D five minutes before the baby collapsed. It was signed for by her and Caroline Oakley. Miss Oakley said she couldn't explain the signature as she was on her break. She described the rash on child D as something she had not seen before in her 20 plus years of working with neonates. She described it as a deep red brown, different from mottling, different to what I had seen before. Dr Emily Thomas said in agreed evidence that child D came out in a rash which faded after treatment. Mr Johnson says the description she provided was remarkably similar to that provided by others but wasn't challenged on it. Dr Brunton said Child D had developed a rash. In his notes, quote, nurses noted that became extremely mottled, plus, plus, plus. Also noted to have tracking lesions, dark brown, black across trunk. Mr Johnson says this explains, I don't remember. He says if Letby had remembered Child D, she would also have to admit it was either her or somebody else in the room with her that gave this description to Dr Brunton. Letby had said several times, I don't remember that being discussed at the time. Mr Johnson says it was recorded here. Mr Johnson says the similar descriptions given by the doctors and nurses of the discoloration were because the causes of the collapses were the same. Child D's discoloration had gone by 2.35am. Dr Brunton noted the skin discoloration reappeared at the second collapse. Mr Johnson says, what are the chances? At 3.45am, Child D had a third and fatal collapse. Dr Thomas said she was with another baby when she was alerted by a nurse with brown hair and believed she was the designated nurse for Child D and believed she had also been a designated nurse for Child A. Dr Thomas said Letby had said, this is my second baby this has happened to and was upset. Mr Johnson says even here, Letby was associating what happened to Child D with what happened to Child A. Dr Brunton had never seen a baby behave like this prior or since. Dr Brunton was struck by Child D's rapid collapses and recoveries. Mr Johnson says it tells you Child D was sabotaged and Letby was lying when she said she didn't remember. 
Mr Johnson says Letby's police interviews were unremarkable, but when asked about baby's deaths in evidence, she replied, you don't forget things like that, they stay with you. Mr Johnson says if this is the case, then here we have someone who doesn't remember a baby collapsing on three separate occasions and subsequently dying. He asks if Letby was trying to gain sympathy from the jury. Mr Johnson said that Letby was asked in police interview if the events of Child D had upset her. She replied, I honestly can't remember. Letby said in a message to a colleague on June 22, 2015, Child D collapsed and had full recess. So upsetting for everyone. Parents absolutely distraught. Dad screaming. Mr Johnson says this was on Father's Day. He says Letby from the text messages did in fact remember Child D. Professor Owen Arthur said in evidence the minor infection in Child D was improving. He added one of the lines of gas in the post-mortem examination was highly unusual. He said he had similar findings in Child A and Child O. He said he had never seen so much air in the great vessels. Another medical expert, Dr Marna Reedes, had ruled out sepsis and concluded Child D was killed by an air embolus. Dr Sandy Bowen said Child D was recovering from pneumonia and the speed of the collapse was very unusual and not indicative of infection. She concluded the cause of the collapse was air embolus. Child D's distress and rash description supported her opinion. She rejected the evidence that taking Child D off CPAP caused her death. Dr Evans viewed the case as one where air embolus was the only viable cause of death. He was cross-examined about the blood gas record for Child D. Mr Johnson says Dr Bowen had given evidence to say the blood gas record was satisfactory. Mr Johnson is now turning to the case of Child G on three counts of attempted murder. Child G was the most premature of all the babies with the lowest birth weight. Mr Johnson tells the court Child G had the grossest misfortune to meet Lucy Letby when she was transferred to the Countess of Chester Hospital. He refers to Child G's 100th day of life on September 7th 2015 when a banner was put up and the cake had been baked to mark the occasion. He says on that day she suffered a severe brain injury which has left her dependent on her parents. Mr Johnson says all the experts agree Child G was in a very satisfactory position prior to her collapse. Mr Johnson says let be new Child G's 100th day and the premature baby's due date. Mr Johnson says Dr Evans had described Child G's vomit on September the 7th was extraordinary and nurses had described the extent of the vomit was something they had never seen before. He says there are two choices that Child G was sabotaged by being overfed, or having tolerated escalating amounts of milk, she then vomited with unprecedented force due to an infection which no staff had ever seen present itself before or since. Some people may say there is a first time for everything, Mr Johnson says, but adds this is no naturally occurring event and has been seen in several other babies' cases, including Child C, Child J, Child K and Child N. Mr Johnson says nursing notes showed a normal baby feeding properly in the hours before Child G's vomit on September 7th. At 8pm on September 6th, nursing colleagues said Child G was stable and well. A staffing rotor for the night is shown for September 6th to 7th. This was a quiet night. Child G received a full feed from a bottle at 11pm and was thriving. Mr Johnson says little babies don't take full feeds from bottles unless they are happy little babies. He says Letby has massaged the times as she had done in several other cases. Mr Johnson says the prosecution suggests the vomit was at 2.30am, not 2.15. Nursing colleague Elsa Simpson initially said she was with Letby when Child G projectile vomited at 2.15am. And if that was true... Letby could not have been the cause of it. In a subsequent interview, she said she didn't know where the other nurses were. Mr Johnson says Letby's nursing note on September the 7th includes, quote, 
care given from 0 to 100 to present. Child G had large projectile milky vomit at 2.15. Mr Johnson says it's an interesting line that Letby had given care from 2am. He says this note is written six and a half hours later and the jury should take that with care, especially with Letby as she habitually misrecorded information. Mr Johnson says Child G wouldn't have tolerated a 45 ml milk feed under gravity if the stomach was already containing undigested milk. He says Elsa Simpson's original account does not correspond with the neonatal review, as Elsa Simpson fed a different child in room 1 at 2.20, child G being in room 2. That child was demanding food, Mr Johnson says, and that takes time. Medication was co-signed for child G at 1.42 by Elsa Simpson and another child at 2.13. Mr Johnson says all this material shows she was very busy at this time and cannot be accurate with the 2.15am timing of the event. Dr Allison Ventress recorded, Child G had very large projectile vomit reaching chair next to cot and canopy, called urgently at 2.35am. Mr Johnson says Dr Ventress was called urgently as Child G suffered a catastrophic brain injury. Mr Johnson says Elsa Simpson was distracted in room 1, her colleague had gone on a break, and that gave Let Be the perfect time to sabotage Child G and misrepresent it in the notes. Mr Johnson says Child G was force-fed milk and air injected by using the plunger in the syringe. He says Let Be took advantage of taking on Child G's care. Dr Ventress was later called out of theatre to intubate Child G and noted blood-stained secretions coming from the vocal cords. Dr Stephen Breary, asked about Child G's desaturations on the ventilator, said, quote, I can't explain that. It's unusual for babies to desaturate on ventilators. The fact that Dr Ventress was getting chest movement from Child G was perplexing and I cannot think of a natural cause of why that would happen. Mr Johnson says the truth was it was an unnatural process caused by Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson asks what would cause child G's throat to bleed, as similar to the cases of child E, child N, child O and child H. He says it was sabotage by Letby. It is a signature of many of her attacks on these babies. After 6am on September the 7th, 100ml of air and fluid was aspirated from child G. Mr Johnson says the only source of that was from Lucy Letby, who caused the baby a devastating brain injury. After that, child G's saturation levels improved and she did not have issues with her stomach. Mr Johnson says what was vomited and aspirated was nothing to do with infection. Dr Sandy Bowen remarked that the baby had been very stable prior to the collapse. The pH reading showed child G's stomach was empty and discounted the possibility of there being undigested milk. If there had been an infection, there would have been subtle markers present in observations. She rejected the suggestion by Let Be an interview that child G swallowed air when vomiting. Dr Bowen said child G was extraordinarily premature and an observation of bloodstained secretions was down to the use of a tube on June 14th, 2015. Let Be in interview remembered her colleague was on a break and would not have left child G alone. Let be suggested the vomit had not left the cot. Mr Johnson says this is at odds with agreed evidence and the note made at the time by Dr Ventress. Let be said she had seen child G vomiting. Upon child G's return to the Countess of Chester Hospital, having been transferred to Arrow Park for several days, she had the misfortune, Mr Johnson says, to be in Let be's care on September the 21st. On September the 21st, Letby was designated nurse for child G and two other babies in room 4. Letby said in a nursing note that at 10.15am, child G, quote, produced two large milky projectile vomits. Mr Johnson says child G had been sabotaged again by Letby shortly after recording entirely normal observations. Child G's abdomen was noted to be more distended than usual. Mr Johnson says Letby misrepresented what the situation was 
when she texted a nursing colleague that night, saying child G looked rubbish when I took over this morning and she had inherited a problem which Mr Johnson says was untrue. Mr Johnson says if child G did look so bad, she would have referred her to a doctor first before feeding. Mr Johnson says it's a lie to divert the suspicion. Letby was involved in a text message conversation regarding the message that said, looked rubbish this morning. Letby added, quote, I personally felt it was a big jump considering how sick she was just a week ago. Being in four is bad enough, and then having nursery nurses that just don't always know. Mum said she hasn't been herself for a couple of days. Mr Johnson says it fits Letby's narrative that nursery nurses are bad. He says the false narrative could not be clearer, as Letby also recorded Child G's poor condition in nursing notes written retrospectively. Mr Johnson moves to the second incident on September 21st, 2015 for Child G. He says this was when Child G was having a cannula inserted behind a screen at about 3.30pm and there were problems with the insertion. Child G was put onto a trolley to carry out the procedure. A nursing colleague said in evidence she had contacted police one month prior to say Letby had not switched off the monitor in this event and one of the doctors had apologised to her for not putting the monitor back on. Dr David Harkness said the monitor was, quote, definitely not turned off and said they were, quote, so keen to get fluids going again for child G as it had been six hours since she last had fluids and child G was not just left alone. In cross-examination, it was put to him he had previously said collapses among neonates of child G's age was quite common. He replied that was his experience in Chester, but his experience in other places since had showed that that was not the case, and now refuted the suggestion. Mr Johnson says the nurse was out of the room for child G and Letby was in room 4. The nursing colleague said child G was back in the cot after hearing Lucy Letby shouting for help. Letby had said she moved child G from the trolley to the cot and neopuffed her. Mr Johnson said it is not a credible suggestion. Dr Gibbs had said whatever the position was with the monitor, he would have made sure child G was stable when he left her post cannulation and would have told someone he had finished with the cannulation. Mr Johnson says if the nursing colleague wasn't in the room, the other person who would have been contacted would have been Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson says this is another occasion where Letby had attempted to kill child G. The nursing colleague said she could not remember a conversation about being crossed that child G had been left alone on a trolley with the monitor off or that a Datix form should be filled in for that event. Dr Evans said the first September 21st incident was all indicative that child G had been overfed with potentially catastrophic consequences. Dr Sandy Bowen said it was basic arithmetic, two large milky vomits plus 30 mils aspirate meant child G was fed much more than she should have been. Mr Johnson turns to the case of child H. He refers to a transfer form from the Countess of Chester Hospital to Arrow Park and also of child H's deterioration and the chest drains used. The form ends, the acute episodes with desaturations and bradycardias do not seem to be directly related to the respiratory problems. Child H's mother said Child H was like a completely different baby at Arrow Park. Mr Johnson says Child H had respiratory distress syndrome, which is not unusual for a neonatal baby. There were two events where Child H desaturated, which were unusual. Cross-examination of Letby said staffing levels did not contribute to the collapse of Child H. Mr Johnson tells the court the baby always had one-to-one -one nursing care and the delay in issuing surfactant did not have anything to do with the collapse. Mr Johnson says for the two counts, the tube was not blocked and staff could hear air going in and out of child H's lungs. Mr Johnson tells the court, Professor Arthurs, a professor in radiology, made a significant contribution to the debate on chest drains. He said chest drains do not normally cause bradycardia or desaturations and chest drain positions are not examined in detail as they do not cause problems. He said the interpretation of a chest drain position was his area of expertise. He said in his opinion the chest drains were in the space they were supposed to be. 
Mr Johnson tells the jury they do not have to accept his evidence, but that there is no evidence to contradict it. Mr Johnson says the first significant collapse happened on September 25th, 26th, 2015. Letby was the designated nurse in room 1. No other babies were in room 1. The father's statement was read out to the court. He said he and his wife had spent time in a neonatal unit until September 25th. He said he had been there until about midnight, had come back to the house and was awoken by a call needing to go back to the hospital. He said, when I got back, I definitely remember Lucy being there doing the chest massaging. It was explained to us Child H had collapsed. Child H was a very strange colour. I remember the mottling was running out of her skin towards her fingers. Lucy Letby's nursing notes read, 2330 bradycardia and desaturation were crying Neopuff in 100% to recover. 10 mil air aspirated from chest drain by registral ventris. Following poor blood gas and 100% oxygen requirement, consultant Gibbs attended the unit and inserted a third chest drain. Mr Johnson says 2330 is the time put in by Letby. Dr Ventress recorded, quote, 2350, several episodes of desaturation in past two hours. Mr Johnson said Letby had told her of several episodes. Where has that come from? Dr Ventress wrote, First one after gas taken, good gas. Mr Johnson says Letby wrote on an intensive care chart a desaturation of 52% at 2210, which does not appear at all in the notes. Mr Johnson says there is nothing in the observation charts to suggest there is anything wrong during this period. He says the parent has an uneventful night before he left. The doctor is given a long list of problems, but there is nothing in the nursing record to what Letby told Dr Ventress. Mr Johnson says this was getting other people to record problems for a child where none existed, as was the case for child E. Child E hadn't got a problem until Lucy Letby caused a problem. Dr Ventress had recorded a second chest drain was, quote, almost out. Mr Johnson says moving chest drains was a very effective way of sabotaging a child, as would moving an ET tube. Mr Johnson says child H was in very, very poor shape, and after being in arrest for 22 minutes, the father noted the mottling. Dr Gibbs ruled out all natural causes for child H. He ruled out involvement of the chest drains. Mr Johnson says the evidence of Professor Arthur's puts this all to bed anyway. For the second event for child H, Dr Matthew Neen believed it was Letby who was the designated nurse for child H on that shift when it was nurse Shelley Tomlins. Letby had messaged her colleague that night, quote, I've been helping Shelley, so at least still involved but haven't got the responsibility. Mr Johnson says this builds Letby's plausible deniability. He says we know Letby was supposed to be in nursery room 2, not in room 1 where child H was. Mr Johnson says it shows the state of mind of Letby that night, similar to the state of mind for when she killed child C. Mr Johnson says this was another case where a child was desaturating to life-threatening levels despite good air entry. The ET tube was checked by Shelley Tomlins and there was no blockage. Mercifully, child H was revived. An x-ray showed there was no issue with the pneumothorax. The father said child H was okay during the day, then it was shortly after he had gone to get some rest when he had a knock on the door to go to be with child H at the cot side as she had deteriorated. Mr Johnson says this was yet another opportunity for Letby to sabotage a child. Dr Neem recalled it was Lucy Letby who briefed him on the second collapse for child H. He recalled he was more concerned by this second collapse. A further collapse occurred at 3.30am despite child H having good air entry and she was transferred to Arrow Park where she recovered quickly. Dr Evans said the pneumophoruses were not the cause of the arrests. He ruled out infection as a cause of the collapses as they were rapid and catastrophic. She was on antibiotics and a lumbar puncher proved she did not have an infection. He was at a loss to explain the collapse, but it was not one of natural causes. Dr Bowen said there were delays with the surfactant. She said she could find no clinical or mechanical cause for the collapses. 
She said she had never known a chest drain to cause a collapse or stresses by the baby resulting in cardiac arrest. Professor Arthur saw no problem with the chest drains. Mr Johnson says the chest drains can be ruled out as a problem. He adds there was no disease or mechanical factor and it was undoubtedly sabotaged by Lucy Letby. He says both collapses happened just after Child H's parents had left, which had parallels with other cases and was a signature of Letby's work. Mr Johnson says there are four children left to go through, Child I, Child J, Child N and Child Q. He first details the case of Child I. Mr Johnson says evidence have been heard of Child I that medics do not worry about self-correcting desaturations. Mr Johnson says having failed to kill child G and child H, she turned her attention to child I and was designated nurse for two of the four occasions in which she tried to kill the baby girl and also falsified notes along the way. Mr Johnson says it was important to note from the post-mortem evidence that child I did not have NEC, a gastrointestinal disease. Mr Johnson says child I's first collapse was marked with a desaturation to the 30s and had vomited on September 30th. He says the day before, Dr Lucy Beebe had reviewed child I. She remembered seeing child I from memory, as the girl became unwell, was shipped out, recovered and then came back. She said this was unusual for her short time at the unit. Dr Beebe had said she was shocked and frustrated by a child eye's death as she felt there was something going on which they, the staff, were not aware of. Dr Beebe said the aim for child eye after the September 29th review was to continue feeding and growing the baby girl. The day rotor for September 30th had let be as designated nurse for child eye and two other babies in room 3. Mr Johnson says let be did not like being in room 3. The plan was to give child I immunisations, as was the case for child G. He says there was nothing wrong with child I, who was receiving cares from the mother and the feed. Mr Johnson says child I produced a small stool at 10am. The 10am feeding chart is signed by Letby. The doctors were very happy with child I, Mr Johnson tells the court. Dr Beebe's note is shown to the court for September 30th. Mr Johnson says it is important to note the reason for the review. It was, quote, asked to review as reduced temperature. Mr Johnson says child I was taking full bottles, gaining weight, and Dr Beebe recorded that child I was handling well. Child I, during the examination, produced a yellow seedy stool which indicated good gut health. Dr Beebe said this was not a sign of NEC. Mr Johnson says child I was not in distress and the abdomen was the same as yesterday. The plan was to monitor child I closely and raise the cot temperature. Child I appeared clinically well. Child I's mother in evidence said Lucy let me raise the issue with her about child I's stomach. Mr Johnson says that was not the same reason let me gave to Dr Beebe. So what exactly is going on here? Mr Johnson says no concern was expressed to medical staff about child eye's abdomen by Lucy Letby. Why was Lucy Letby expressing concern to child eye's mother about the abdomen? Why did Lucy Letby not raise the issue with Dr Beebe? Mr Johnson says Letby was gaslighting the mother by suggesting a problem with child eye that didn't exist until she caused that problem. Mr Johnson says everything was unremarkable for child I until 1pm when she was asleep and fed via NGT. The mother said she had gone to meet the family in the canteen at this time. The feed chart shows a 35 mil feed for child I, which Mr Johnson says would take some time, around 15 minutes, taking until 1.15pm. He says the nursing notes are accurate as they are time stamped by the computer automatically. The note is written between 1.36 to 1.48pm. It was at most 20 minutes after the feed ended. Mr Johnson says the details of the feed and review recorded are not correct. He says the addendum of 1500 doctor's examination of child I is a complete fabrication. 
A male doctor's note records examining child eye at 4.30pm. Mr Johnson asks who these doctors were who examined child eye at 3pm. He adds the 3pm note contains, quote, Child eye appeared mottled in colour with distended abdomen and more prominent veins. Mr Johnson says there is no corresponding doctor's note for this examination of mottling. Letby's note stated, full monitoring recommenced. An observation note records this was done from 3pm. Mr Johnson says Dr Beeb had advised this at 11.40. He asks why did Letby only recommence full monitoring after Child Eye's mother had left the unit. Mr Johnson says Letby is transposing events, including a note of a yellow CD stool from 11.40am to 3pm to an examination which never actually happened. Mr Johnson says it's a very calculated way of giving the impression a child had a problem when the child had no problem at all. Child Eye's mother had a routine for each day, visiting Child Eye at regular times and the father would come in from after 5pm. Mr Johnson said the time between 3 and 5pm was her window of opportunity to attack Child L. What are the chances of these things happening at precisely this point? Letby had written, quote, Mummy present when reviewed by doctors, had left units when child I had large vomits and transferred to nursery one. Mr Johnson says Letby had tried to give the impression a neopuff caused the inflated stomach for child I. He says remarkably child I improved and there were minimal aspirates. Yet another miraculous recovery, all good once Lucy Letby had left. Medical expert Dr Evans ruled out infection and said the only explanation was a dose of air administered through the NG tube. Dr Sandy Bowen agreed and the effect would have been to splint the diaphragm. She discounted the possibility of NEC. Professor Owen Arthurs said the stomach and almost all of the gut had been distended. Mr Johnson says that was from administered air. The second incident for Child I on October 13th, 2015 at 3.20am is now being detailed by Mr Johnson. The first part of the night shift had Child I being fed normally. Mr Johnson says the second event was much more serious than the first. Before it, Child I had been in a good clinical condition. He says it was expected she was coming up for discharge from the hospital in a couple of weeks. Letby was the designated nurse for a baby in room 1. Nurse Ashley Hudson was the designated nurse for child G, child I and another baby in room 2. Ashley Hudson left room 2 to attend to another baby in room 1, assisting colleague Laura Eagles. She asked a colleague to monitor child I, either Caroline Oakley or Lucy Letby. Caroline Oakley had no recollection of being called. Miss Hudson said she had been in room 1 and some milk needed defrosting for child eyes feed. When she got back there were no adults in the room. She started to prepare the milk with her back to child eye. The next thing she remembered was Lucy Letby in the doorway who pointed out that child eye looked pale. She was about 5 or 6 feet away from child eye. She said something along the lines of, don't you think child eye looks pale? Miss Hudson said the light in room 2 was low and the lights were on in the corridor. Mr Johnson reminds the jury what Lucy Letby said about this in interview. Mr Johnson refers to Letby's 2019 police interview in which she said room 2's light was off, there was an element of light coming from the doorway and child eye was by the window. Ashley Hudson said child eye had a blanket over her and a tent structure keeping her secure. She said she could not see child eye due to the canopy and the lighting. Mr Johnson says Letby did not have a better view. Miss Hudson said she switched on the light and looked at child eye who was gasping, incredibly pale and in a very bad way. Miss Hudson initially thought the deterioration was so rapid she thought she was too late to save her. She said, you cannot see a child from the position Lucy Letby was in. Mr Johnson says we have a head-on credibility conflict of two accounts who don't live in the same world. 
Mr Johnson says in cross-examination, Letby was asked about looking from a brightly lit corridor into a dark room and would that improve her ability to see? He says her first response was, I don't know. She conceded she would not have been able to see, yet still persisted that she could see child eye. We had a break, we came back and I asked Lucy what she had said in interview. He says Letby had said, maybe I spotted something Ashley couldn't spot. Mr Johnson had asked Letby, you don't have better eyesight than Ashley, do you? Letby replied, no. The question is, how would you be able to spot the colouring of child eye better than Ashley Hudson from the same point of view? Letby replied, I had more experience, so I knew what I was looking for, knew what I was looking at. Mr Johnson adds, you will remember the way she corrected herself. He says there was a very long pause and he added at the time, it's your answer, you explain it. He said Letby was finding it difficult to concentrate on all the dates. Mr Johnson said there was nothing about the dates in this context. He says did Letby make an innocent mistake or did something else slip out under the pressure of the witness box? He says Letby caused a problem for child eye. He says child eye recovered well. Mr Johnson says Letby had timed her note, having seen Ashley Hudson's nursing note first, so it appeared she saw child eye first. Mr Johnson says it is another case of plausible deniability. Professor Arthur said child eye's large bowel was distended. Dr Evans said the only explanation was air administered to child eye via the NG tube. Mr Johnson says Dr Bowen explained child eye was sabotaged by air administered via the NG tube or via the IV line. Dr Anne Boothroyd's x-ray report on September 30th recorded, quote, there is splinting of the diaphragm due to bowel distension. For the third event for child eye, Dr Ravi Jayram said there were no clinical concerns for child eye before the night of October 13th to 14th. Mr Johnson says evidence was heard to say child eye was stable. This was the second time Lucy Letby was the designated nurse. Mr Johnson says this was the second time she had the opportunity to falsify notes. Dr Matthew Neem's note at 5.55am is shown to the court for October 14th. Mr Johnson says this is not a retrospectively written note, as it includes a note of a prescription which is timestamped at 5.56am and an urgent x-ray which is timed at 6.05. He says Letby's addendum note made at 8.43am after child eye had desaturated said quote, at 0500 abdomen noted to be more distended and firmer in appearance with area of discoloration spreading on the right hand side, veins more prominent. Mr Johnson asks, why would Lucy Letby do this? He says to bear in mind what happened the previous night. If these symptoms were shown, then the doctor would be called urgently. He says the absence of a doctor called shows there was no problem at 5am. Mr Johnson says from the paper trail, if anyone puts two and two together and thinks there's a problem with Lucy Letby, they are immediately thrown off the scent. Dr Neem said the mottling was unusual and that was why he recorded it. How many times have we heard that in this case? Mr Johnson says the abdomen was distended. Dr Marnarides had excluded NEC. Mr Johnson says the only possibility is pushing air in down the NG tube. Dr Neem said child eye looked uncomfortable when examined and grimaced. He noted the abdominal distension. Professor Arthur said of the x-ray image, the stomach was markedly dilated and the small bowel and the large bowel were also dilated with no symptoms of NEC. Another image at 8.03am had the stomach decompressed and the third image the following day showed no problems at all. Dr Neem recorded a further desaturation for child eye at 7am and the ET tube was reintubated. It was noted there was good air entry for child eye, but as Mr Johnson says, in so many other cases for babies in this trial, child eye was desaturating. Child eye had further desaturations on October 14th to 15th, which Mr Johnson said were explicable as there were secretions in the NG tube. 
Child Eye had a miraculous recovery after being transferred to Arrow Park and improved until coming into the misfortune of contact with Lucy Letby. Dr Evans thought Child Eye's stomach had been injected with air and air injected into the intravenous system. There was an astonishing amount of air in Child Eye's stomach. Dr Bowen concluded Child Eye had air administered. Mr Johnson turns to the fourth and final collapse for Child Eye on October 22nd, 23rd, 2015, in which Child Eye died. Mr Johnson says Ashley Hudson had given evidence to say Child Eye was very easy to settle, and although Child Eye was in nursery room one, that was as a precaution given her history of episodes. Child Eye was self-ventilating in air and her saturations optimal and she looked very well, pink, well perfused and a soft non-distended abdomen. Caroline Oakley said in a statement Child Eye's abdomen was fine and soft non-distended. Mr Johnson says that is the background to Child Eye when Lucy Letby came on shift that night. Lucy Letby was designated nurse for a baby in room 2 and a baby in room 3. Ashley Hudson was designated nurse for Child Eye and another baby. Child Eye was in a virtually perfect clinical scenario, Mr Johnson tells the court. He says Letby got herself involved. Child Eye gave a cry that had not been heard before, loud and relentless according to Ashley Hudson who interpreted it as distress. When she was repositioned on her tummy at about midnight, Child Eye stopped breathing. Resuscitation efforts began and Child Eye then began to fight the ventilator. Dr John Gibbs was told of the child's abnormal cry. He said he was perplexed at Child Eye's rapid deterioration and recovery, which would not show a sign of infection. Mr Johnson says let be falsified paperwork for one of her designated babies at this time, the baby to be transferred to Stoke. Let be recorded a note at 10.50 to 10.52pm. Note of a 10% glucose infusion for Stoke baby. The infusion note is written as starting at 2300 and that writing is changed to 2400. Mr Johnson says it was changed to give let be an alibi for midnight. Ashley Hudson said she was alerted to Child Eye at 1.06am by either the alarm going off or Child Eye crying. She said in room 1, Letby was already there at Child Eye's cot side and had her hands in the incubator. Mr Johnson says Letby had sabotaged Child Eye and caused Child Eye to cry. Mr Johnson says Letby put Ashley Hudson off by saying she just needs to settle. Air++ was aspirated from Child Eye. Mr Johnson asks how that could have got there other than being forced in by Lucy Letby. Dr Rachel Chang could see air entry and chest movement on Child Eye, but Child Eye wasn't recovering. She said Child Eye's death was inexplicable. Dr John Gibbs noted mottling on Child Eye. He said he could not understand why Child Eye had died and referred the case to the coroner. The grieving parents agreed to bathe Child I. Mr Johnson said despite having two designated babies to care for and Child I not being her designated baby, Let Be met the parents. The mother said, Lucy came back in. She was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at Child I's first bath and how much Child I had loved it. I wish she had just stopped talking. Eventually I think she realised and stopped. It wasn't what we wanted to hear. Dr Evans says this was another case in Child Eye receiving air administered. He thought the case of the collapse, the crying, the prolonged resuscitation, the purple and white discoloration were all symptoms of air embolus. There was no account of natural disease. Dr Bowen said the cause of death was air embolus from the unexpected catastrophic collapse, Child Eye being unsettled and agitated, the extremely unusual crying meaning child eye was in excruciating pain. In cross-examination, Dr Bowen was asked if she had a coherent explanation for an air embolus. Mr Johnson said Dr Bowen's answer, without hesitation, lasted for about 10 minutes. She was asked about child eye's poor weight gain, and Dr Bowen said that did not make her more likely to have a cardiac arrest. 
Professor Arthur said it was unusual to see that amount of dilation in child eye stomach. He excluded CPAP belly as a cause. He said it was reasonable to infer air administered. Dr Marnarides said at the time of child eye's death, she had no acute illnesses or abnormalities in the bowel, other than the presence of air. The presence of gas had no pathological cause. He said the collapses were air administered from the NG tube. Mr Johnson says child eye's case is a stark one. He says let be made repeated efforts to kill child eye and falsified notes for both child eye and another baby. She gave herself away in the event with Ashley Hudson. Lucy Letby's behaviour in the aftermath of Child Eye's death was bizarre and inappropriate. She revelled in what she had done. Her voyeuristic tendencies caused her to look up Child Eye's mother on Facebook. Having killed her, she wrote a condolence card. It was still on her phone when it was seized by the police. Mr Johnson details the case of Child J. He says when Letby was giving evidence in this case, she said band 4 nursery nurses cannot do intensive care, high dependency babies or handling of stomas. Letby said the unit was very busy as an explanation why a band 4 nurse was caring for child J. Mr Johnson says the implication of that exchange was to give the impression child J received incompetent care and staffing levels were compromised. Letby had messaged a colleague on November the 19th, 2015, quote, It's shocking, really, that they are willing to take on responsibility for things they have no training or experience on. Don't think they appreciate the potential difficulties. Mr Johnson says the jury will remember witnesses had been cross-examined about nursing guidelines. He says the part that was never quoted was the bit about stomas. The care, shown to the court, says special care day nurses can include care of a stoma. Mr Johnson says that whole evidence was designed to mislead you. Mr Johnson says child J had no respiratory difficulties, was being bottle fed and did not need respiratory support, having been put in room 4. Nurse Nicola Dennison said child J was getting ready to go home with a stoma by November 26, 2015. She wrote in notes that child J was stable. Child J's mother left at the end of the day, intending to return at 8am the following day, but received an emergency call overnight. Letby was in room 3, designated nurse for two babies that night shift. Nicola Dennison was the designated nurse for child J and one other baby in room 4. Child J desaturated at 4.40am on November 27th. Mary Griffith was working in room 2. She said in evidence Child J was a joy to look after and described the first desaturation which she and Nicola Dennison both dealt with. The desaturation was alarmingly low. Miss Dennison said after cross-examination Child J collapsed after her feed. Dr Verhees recorded the shift was busy. Twins had been admitted to room 1 at 6.10am. He said he reviewed Child J once and all the information was given to him by nursing staff. He noted there had been two profound desaturations timed at 5.15am. Child J was moved to nursery too when a designated nurse was Mary Griffith. Mr Johnson says Letby was then involved in care of babies in room 2 despite her designated babies being in room 3. Letby had said in a text, the unit was closed trying to get someone in. At 6.49am, she messaged, quote, it's all a bit tits up. Mr Johnson says resources have been diverted to room 1 and this was the perfect opportunity for Letby to attack Child J. At 6.56am, Child J collapsed. Mary Griffith noted Child J's monitor went off at 0650. Myself and L. Letby attended. Found baby with pale hands and baby very rigid. Sats went to 7 and heart rate to 68. Child J neopuffed with little improvement. Dr. Gibbs on unit and called to help. Neopuff continued for 16 minutes until Sats improved. Mr. Johnson says this was a serious enough incident for the consultant to be called. A glucose bolus was started at 7.20am, which Mr. Johnson says was administered by Letby. 
At 7.40am, according to nursing notes, child J desaturated again. Her fists were clenched, her eyes were rolling to the left, and let B got involved again. Dr Gibbs recorded at 7.35am two seizures. He said he remembered Mary Griffith and Lucy Letby were there when he arrived. A seizure was reasonably long, about 10 minutes. Mr Johnson says prior to these events, Child J had never had a seizure and she has not had one since. She recovered very well afterwards. He adds blood tests were normal and showed no signs of infection. A brain scan showed no abnormality, nor in an x-ray. Dr Gibbs said an oxygen drop was the reason for the seizure, but could not find a reason for the oxygen drop. Dr Stephen Breary said there was no explanation for the deteriorations. Dr Evans said there was no marker of infection for child J. He said if there had been, the recovery would not have been so quick. He agreed there had been a lack of oxygen and it had not been an epileptic seizure. Dr Bowen said babies who are ready to go home do not have collapses which require prolonged resuscitation and a quick recovery. Mr Johnson says the cause of the collapses bear all the hallmarks of an attack by Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson said Child J was prospering prior to the attacks and the attack happened while the unit was distracted by two emergency admissions. He says at that time, when it was all hands to the pump, Letby was on her phone. He says Letby stopped texting seven minutes before Child J's collapse. Letby's suggestion that she had little memory of the event is not realistic, as that night was punctuated by two emergency admissions to the unit. He says Letby was running with the I don't remember line to avoid answering questions. He says Letby searched for Child J's parents, which is inexplicable other than through an unnatural interest in them. Mr Johnson moves to the case of Child N. He says Child N was sabotaged by Lucy Letby as he was getting ready to go home. The first instant was characteristic of Lucy Letby's handiwork, Mr Johnson says. Her colleague Christopher Booth had gone on a break. Mr Johnson suggests Letby was in her least favourite room that day in Nursery 4 with only two babies and had time on her hands by texting about Melanie Taylor's shortcomings and a male doctor. He says that includes the Go Commando comment, which he says let me lied about not knowing its meaning. If she's not even prepared to tell you the truth on something so trivial, what is she prepared to tell you the truth about? Mr Johnson says Letby's interviews are very revealing in relation to the texts in the case of Child N. He refers to the 2020 police interview. Letby was asked if she knew Child N had haemophilia. She replied she didn't. Mr Johnson says that was a lie. There was a handover sheet in the Morrison's bag at her home which documented Child N had haemophilia. On the 2nd of June 2016, Letby was recorded caring for two babies in room 4, including giving a feed to one of the babies, a 50 mil feed to a baby who was asleep. Mr Johnson says it would take 15 to 20 minutes. He says the 2030 time could mean any time between 2015 and 2045. Mr Johnson says the keypad on Lucy Letby's phone must have been hot, as Letby was texting constantly at this time. He says it is accepted people do text at work, but giving an NG tube feed is a two-handed process, and you can't do that if you're texting at the same time. He says there are 41 text messages in the conversation, and that cannot be done if you are giving in the proper way an NG tube feed. Mr Johnson says Letby was asked about this, how it could be done. Letby replied, it can't. Mr Johnson had told Letby there was one method of administering a feed quickly. Letby replied, you think I pushed it in? Nicholas Johnson replied, that's what you were doing, wasn't it? Letby replied, no. Designated nurse Christopher Booth said for the incident, he went for a break around 1am on June 3rd. Sophie Ellis was giving a feed at the time and only had a vague memory of child N and had a number of designated babies that night. Melanie Taylor was making an entry on a fluid balance chart and had no memory of child N. Valerie Thomas was a nursery nurse who would not have been in room 1. 
Mr Johnson says the process of elimination was it was Lucy Letby who was in room 1 as she wasn't recorded doing anything at that time. Dr Jennifer Lockerhan noted Child N was unsettled and these saturations had gone to 40%. He was dusky and mottled, he was screaming. Dr Evans said the 30 minute crying was unusual as was the speed of the decline. He could think of no naturally occurring or innocent cause. Dr Bowen said the desaturation was life-threatening and there was nothing to suggest it was an innocent event. There must have been an inflicted painful stimulus to cause a life-threatening collapse. Mr Johnson says that same kind of injury was inflicted by Letby on child O 20 days later, causing a liver injury. He says this attack happened on a baby who was perfectly well just after the designated nurse had gone on a break. Mr Johnson is now referring to events on June 15, 2016. He says the day before on June 14th, Letby was Child N's designated nurse. It was planned for Child N to go home that week. On June 14th, notes are shown showing Child N had a 45 mil feed at 7.40am. At 8.17am, Letby complained she had had to feed Child N. She messaged, quote, bottle not done. Mr Johnson says the 45 mil feed took until about 8.15am. Letby had noted Child N was almost ready for home. Child N's mother fed Child N at 11.50am. Mr Johnson says Letby noted at 2.20pm, Mummy visiting this morning carried out cares and feed. Aware that once jaundice treatment discontinued, infants will be ready for home. Mr Johnson says Letby did something to destabilise Child N at the end of her day shift to give the impression of an underlying problem. Jennifer Jones Key reported that in the night, Child N was unsettled. She wrote in nursing notes, At the start of the shift, Baby N nursed in incubator with eye protection in situ. Baby very unsettled early part of night. Mr Johnson asks what had happened to unsettled Child N that night. He says it is similar to the case of Child P just over a week later. Child N started to desaturate at 1am, looking mottled, and it was escalated to Belinda Simcock and Catherine Percival Ward. A male doctor reviewed Child N and noted he looked normal. Swipe data show Letby came in extra early at 7.12am. Mr Johnson said as soon as she entered, she texted the male doctor, quote, I've escaped being in room 1, back in room 3. Moments later, Child N collapsed. Mr Johnson said Jennifer Jones Key said Child N had fleeting desaturations early in the morning. Mr Johnson says an observation chart showed no worrying signs at all at 5am and 7am for Child N with 100% oxygen saturation levels. Child N had a big desaturation at 7.15am. He says Letby knew she had a chance to sabotage Child N as it would be busy. A colleague had texted her, quote, five admissions, one vent. Jennifer Jones Key said she recalled Letby had gone over and noticed Child N was pale. She said Letby had just come in to say hello as they were friends. Mr Johnson says Letby had been texting two colleagues, not Jennifer Jones Key, the previous day and continued the text with a nursing colleague and a doctor colleague up to 7.12am. Mr Johnson says if she was going in to talk to her friend, she would have gone to the nursing colleague who she had been texting and was on duty. Letby in police interview said she had assumed something had happened for child N to move because of the observations on the chart. She said she had no independent memory of child N. The nursing notes suggested Child M was desaturating on handover. Mr Johnson says the impression given by the note is she was inheriting the problem of the child already desaturating by the time she came on shift. He says Letby was trying to avoid an audit trail. Child M's parents were called in urgently and they saw him being given CPR. The parents recalled Lucy Letby being present. Mr Johnson says let's be made more misleading notes after this collapse for child N. Let's be noted in family communication at 2.10pm, parents contacted by senior nurse Butterworth during intubation. Both phones switched off and no answer on landline. Message left. Call returned shortly after. 
Mr Johnson says that note must refer to the 8am intubation done by a male doctor. His note of intubation drugs given. Mr Johnson says it had been said the parents' statements were agreed, but now they are not. Child N's father said Lucy Letby rang him up and gave details. He added in response to the phone call, I didn't get the impression he was still unwell. He said a different nurse rang up 10 minutes later, telling him to go to the hospital as soon as possible. They arrived at 9am. This was on the day Child N was due to go home. Mr Johnson says if Child N had been a bit unwell during the night, then he was worse now. He says the parents were told Child N was okay, which was not true. He says the parents might just remember the call to tell them there had been an issue with Child N. He says none of this was dealt with when Letby gave evidence to her own counsel. He says when cross-examined, Letby said she believed there was a note by Bernadette Butterworth on family communication. Mr Johnson says this chapter of evidence is littered with contradiction. He asks why it was played down to the parents that child N was unwell. Mr Johnson tells the court that when Letby made the call, she would not have known Jennifer Jones Key had already recorded Letby had been hands-on with child N. In police interview, Letby said she couldn't remember. Mr Johnson says the nursing note was completely misleading and suggested senior nurse Butterworth had been unable to get through to the father of child N. He says Letby came in early to sabotage child N. He says if someone looked at the records, it would look like Letby had a peripheral role in child N's care that day. A subsequent examination at Alderhay of child N showed he had no abnormality with his airway. Child N was intubated. The male doctor said upon the intubation attempt he saw blood. He couldn't see the source of the blood and said the swelling was unusual. He said in cross-examination, it must have been unusual for me to see it. He said in cross-examination, it was possible the bleed could have been caused by an implement used before the first intubation. But if that was the case, he said he would have noticed blood on the equipment. Dr Breary said he could not think of any natural cause why child N had collapsed. At 11.29am, let be messaged, quote, small amounts of blood from mouth and one mil from NG. Looks like pulmonary bleed on x-ray, given factor 8, wait and see. Mr Johnson says Letby was building a narrative. When asked about the one mil fresh blood reading on an intensive care chart at 10am in interview, Letby said she did not remember, and I don't know what I did. Mr Johnson said if this reading is true, she would have escalated it to a doctor as the child had haemophilia. He says if it is not true, it is still a point against Letby. Why would she make a note? Mr Johnson says the jury know it wasn't escalated as there weren't any doctor's notes. Child N's parents came in and left for a break to get something to eat and at that point Child N collapsed. The next event was at 2.59pm when doctors were crashed bleeped to Child N. He says it is a repeat of Child E with a bleed. Dr Saladi encountered, quote, a large swelling at the end of the epiglottis and had never seen this before in a newborn baby. The swelling perplexed Dr Gibbs as well. Dr Breary was called in by Dr Saladi to help. He said they were worried about pulmonary hemorrhage and full intubation was still required. Mr Johnson says we know now it was not pulmonary hemorrhage. Mr Johnson says the suggestion let be first saw blood at this point is completely unconvincing. Mr Johnson says the text to a doctor colleague by Letby is made at 11.29am mentioning small amounts of blood from mouth and one mil from NG. Another note is made on her family communication. Mr Johnson says Letby omitted that in interview. He says the truth is Letby made a damaging admission in interview and proves she sabotaged child N before the arrival of a doctor. Quote, Sorry if I was off during intubation, Bernie winds me up, faffing etc. I like things to be tidy and calm. Mr Johnson says Bernadette Butterworth was getting on Lucy Letby's nerves that day. Letby recorded another one mil of blood at 6pm. When the Alderhay transport team arrived, a female doctor said Letby was agitated and approached the doctor saying, Who are these people? Who are these people? 
Mr Johnson says this is contradictory to what Letby said in interview when she said she was relieved the transport team arrived. He says this is all part of the gaslighting on her colleagues. The female doctor felt Letby's behaviour was out of character from what she had previously experienced. Dr Gibbs said at 7.40pm he was discussing matters with the transport team when someone called for help for child N as his saturation levels had dropped. Mr Johnson asked if this was an innocent coincidence when all the doctors at the time were distracted in a huddle. Mr Johnson says thanks to the skill of the medical team they were able to bring child N back following resuscitation efforts. Child N's time in Alderhey was uneventful and he was discharged three days later. Professor Sally Kinsey said the blood seen by the male doctor at 8am could not have been spontaneous. Somebody caused the bleeding and could not have been seen for the first time hours later by Letby. Mr Johnson says the person who injured child N was undoubtedly Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson lists the common events for the babies in this indictment by categorisation by ones who collapsed despite having good air entry but saturations were dropping, child A, C, D, G, H, second event, I, third event and fourth event, M, O twice and child P. By bleeds and or bleeding in the throat, child C, E, G, H, N, plus false note by Letby in the case of child K. Unusual discoloration, child A, B, D, E, I, M, O, H. Suffered life-threatening collapses out of nowhere, then recovered very quickly. Child B, D, H, both collapses. Child I, events 1 to 3. Child M, N, O, and P. Children who collapsed when designated nurse left or leaving the room. Child C, D, G, first event. I second event and fourth event, child K, N first event, child P third collapse when doctors were out of the room, child Q slight variation when Letby got herself out of the room, and premature babies screaming, crying uncharacteristically at the time of collapse, child D, E, I and N. Children who collapsed shortly after being visited by their parents, child B, H, H, I first event, M, N, O and child P. Children who recovered quickly when taken to other hospitals, child H, I after third collapse, child N and child Q. Mr Johnson says child K's tube never moved after being transferred out of the Countess. When Letby participated in appropriate post-death behaviours, child C, child I and child O. Poisoned by insulin, child F and child L. Mr Johnson says if Letby had not sabotaged seven babies, they would have all have gone home. The other ten babies Letby attempted to murder. That concludes the prosecution's closing speech.